All right, God bless you. Welcome to an Orthodox Extended Podcast, Orthodox Ethos Extended Podcast. Tonight we're going to be looking at the dogma of the Immaculate Conception with our guest, Craig Patrick Trulia, and we hope you will enjoy it. Welcome back to the Orthodox Ethos Podcast. We're really very grateful to God to have this opportunity tonight to have a uh, uh, well-known Orthodox apologist to join us to talk about an important topic that has really been on the scene of the Roman Catholic Orthodox discussion going back quite some time, but ever so often because of a variety of provocations it comes back, and it's important for us as Orthodox Christians or other Christians understand clearly the Orthodox teaching and the Orthodox analysis and rejection of other uh, dogmatic teachings that are contrary to the patristic voice. So I'm going to bring uh, our good friend and uh, uh, brother in Christ, Craig, up. How you doing, Patrick? Say Patrick. How you doing tonight? I'm good, Father. Everyone knows me as Craig, but <laughs> my name in church is Patrick, so... Call me yeah. Patrick. Very good, very good. So we have, um, uh, I'm going to do that so we can see each other better. Uh, we have the opportunity tonight to talk about this in part because uh, we've been promoting our book, uh, our new book, one of our many new books from Uncome Out and Press, uh, dedicated to Catholicism. And I think most people are familiar with it. If they're following this, if we can get that, uh, <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's pretty blurry, Father. It's pretty blurry, yeah. It doesn't really come out. We'll, we <laughs> well, trust us. It's a book. <laughs> it be focused. There, it's focusing there now. It there we got it. Okay, Catholicism in Light of Orthodoxy by Archimandrite George Abbot of Grigoridiu Monastery on Mount Athos. And I, you know, I, I forgive those um, in the English-speaking world who are not familiar with uh, the great uh, and well-known abbot in the Orthodox world, in the Greek Orthodox world especially, but... The truth is that he is a towering figure of patristic orthodoxy in the late 20th century. And we are so honored to be able to publish this little book, which has helped many, many people uh, already in the Greek language to understand what's at stake in the dialogue with Catholicism in the, in the last 30 years, but also to help educate and, and catechize the orthodox people and all goodwilled orth, uh, Roman Catholics who are looking to understand the orthodox position. I mean, Elder George um, is is not simply a abbot on Mount Athos or a monk from Mount Athos. He is also he was also a professor of theology before he left for the monastery. He had a brotherhood in Athens, taught uh, many topics, uh, and uh, has written many many books, uh, and has been revered in the Orthodox world and on Mount Athos as the voice of Mount Athos. So when we had the blessing of the monastery to publish this. We thought it was just an, an, an amazing opportunity for us to take part in and promote his person and his words, which are uh, really authentic and authoritative for the Orthodox Church. So when we posted a couple of days ago a short excerpt from one of the chapters, now this book has, uh, it's a short book. It's not meant to be a, a, a full treatment of the topic, obviously. It's just a meant to touch on the most perhaps the most important, it's got basically five chapters. And he looks he looks at the question of the Vatican State. He looks at the question of the Filioque, of course, uh, created grace, the primacy or authority and fallibility, and then the anthropocentrism of uh, Catholicism and of the West in general. And from that little introduction to that, that, um, uh, that section of the book, which again is very short, we took a short quote, put it online, and we saw that um, another um, an, an apologist for Catholicism over at Reason and Theology uh, wanted to take the advantage to take the opportunity to criticize that and critique it. And so maybe we should just read that before we start our discussion, because that's kind of the beginning of where this this discussion uh, between us uh, offline began. And the, the elder is saying here at the end of his little book, between the two 
the two churches. There exist other differences, such as their teachings concerning the purgatory fire and their teaching concerning our Panagia, the most holy Theotokos, which they name Mariology, declaring as dogma the Immaculate Conception of the All-Holy One. They do not understand that with this, they separate her from the human race, uh, a fact which has soteriological consequences for humanity. For if the virgin possessed a different nature, we're going to unpack all this, obviously, then the Lord taking on human nature from her divinized some other nature and not the nature common to all men. So just a short, obviously there's much, much more the elder could have said, but he's just it, just referencing it really. Uh, so we'll, we'll unpack what we understand the elder is saying, what he's implying, which is not said, uh, and uh, we'll go through that. But uh, before we do that, let me just open it up to, to, uh, uh, to Craig and and. and me, you can give us some words on your end why you thought maybe tonight was a good opportunity to talk about this topic. Yes, it's it's good to be here, Father. It's it's an issue where I think both sides are speaking past each other, and if people understood what those words mean in that context, it probably would have not elicited the comments that it did. Mm. But I think instead of jumping into as it's too common in online apologetics and to unedifying response videos that it would probably be helpful to give a good coverage of what the orthodox doctrine is why it's an apostolic doctrine and then we're going to see that the context it's not going to be very difficult to understand so like that's what i was thinking i was thinking of starting from the beginning it won't take too right. long right. and then once all those pieces are together um the the orthodox doctrine vis-a-vis -vis um the roman catholic doctrine and, and some of the comments were made will make more sense i think i think that's a great idea that's a great idea i'm going to let you begin the process i'm going to jump in here and there uh, with some comments i also want to introduce at some point uh some of the wisdom that we have from our uh father among the saints the great wonder worker of shanghai and san francisco john uh saint john uh, maximovich the, the incorrupt one who has a uh, short uh, chapter, which is very useful as well. But we'll leave that toward the end. And let's go back to the beginning. So let's let's hear more about the, the beginnings of this doctrine that we have, the understanding of the Most Holy Theotokos in the church history and church uh, theology. Yeah, it's, to me, to understand why we venerate the Theotokos, we have to really understand it's because the church has preserve this not only because she is our chief intercessor uh, before God, but also because knowing the Theotokos helps us know Christ. There's soteriological and anthropological implications which are absolutely essential. And so then it shouldn't surprise us that this is not something that popped up so long later in the Middle Ages Right, like Christ was important since, you know, year 35 or whenever the church began, you know, whatever exact year that is in the first century. And so when we look at the earliest sources, I don't think, I think our side, let alone Protestants, but I think our side is not aware of how permeated Marian doctrine was in the early church. Now, in the first 200 years of church history, in 10% of all Christian author, authors, there's approximately 120 in those first 200 years who we have extant sources of, approximately 10% have Marian prayers or explicit Orthodox Marian doctrines like either her assumption, her perpetual virginity, her sinlessness. But when have you ever heard that? 10%, right? It's, it's a way bigger number of people think, and it's surprising given the fact that in the early church, we don't really have many prayer books or, or hymns that are preserved because one, apologetics works were more important during these persecuted times. And two, liturgical sources don't tend to survive history because they're used. I mean, you know, Father, um, when people are holding candles while reading in the dark of the book and the wax is dropping on the book, they don't tend to last that long. Um, like if you use a prayer book every day, it lasts a few years before it becomes, you know, just shreds of paper, pretty much. And so the fact... 
May I ask a question? Because I think sure. this also plays into the que the reason why we don't hear a lot about the Mosul de Teotocos uh, for a lot of church history. And that is because she's not a part of the Kirigma. We don't go and preach the Most Holy Theotokos. We preach Christ. And so the whole focus outwardly to the world is never going to be about the Theotokos. That's an inner life. That's for the people who are initiated and not so much as a uh, evangelical, uh, you know, uh, matter. Isn't that, isn't that partly why we don't have a lot of focus on her, in, especially in the first 300 years when we're persecuted? Well, absolutely, uh, and because there's no controversy that would have justified uh, apologetics works, which there were. I mean, some of the great second century saints are literally called the apologist. That's their nickname. Yes. yes. And so due to the veneration Theotokos being something that would be done during liturgy in prayer, these things are memorized. I, I would challenge people, well, how many Christian hymns do you know from the first 200? Uh, they exist, obviously, but how many do you know from the first 200 years of church history? And people are like, oh, I, I don't think there's barely any. It's because those sources, the, what's in the church tend not to be preserved because mm -hmm. of their use, uh, because they're not going to have patrons where they're dedicating them to Roman emperors and stuff. They would have been just used in the church. But even then, 10% of all the sources all the, you know, of the authors we have, have these Marian doctrines. So if people go, well, I walk into an Orthodox church and marries every other sentence, that seems totally disproportionate to the early church. Well, not exactly for the reason you stated, they're gonna be underrepresenting the sources for archeological reasons to be underrepresented sources, but even then it rises up to 10%. So it's way more than people think. If, if you'd humor me, I'd like to just uh, rattle off uh, yeah. the list so people know I'm not making it up. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Go for and it. so I'm going to say quick, people could rewind uh, and there'll be published work with this. But for example, there's the uh, extension of Isaiah 11, 12 to 14, Ode to Solomon 19, Proto-Evangelicum Proto of James, paragraphs 19 to 20. The fragment of St. Hegesippus, uh, St. Leto of Sardis, fragment 17, the Bodmer Papyrus, um, the Gospel of Bartholomew 417, the Vienna Manuscript, St. Hippolytus in the fragment, Clement, Clement Alexander, Stramata, Book 7, Chapter 16, Origin, Commentary on John, Book 1, Paragraph 6, um, Pseudo John, it's a Dormition homily, Paragraph 47, people could read it, page 396, and Schumacher's 2002 book, Book of Mary's Repose, Paragraph 135, again, page 39, 349, the same book, a archaeological find, the Grotto of Jerusalem, which has a Marian prayer, and I'll just add as a, that was just 12 sources I just named in the first 200 years church history. Here's what didn't make that list because it's 20 years too late. The sub tomb presidium, which no mainstream scholarly source dates before the year 250. But if the earliest actual, like the sources from the year 250, perhaps they're saying second, third, uh, fourth or third century is the actual age of the papyrus. Well, how old's the prayer that the papyrus had written down? could be older. So I just named now 13 sources, most likely within those first 200 years. And the first 12 on uh, mainstream scholarship at the low end, all puts them within those first 200 years. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to address, unless you want to interject, Father, that people say, well, this is from Gnosticism. And then the early church um, acquired uh, the doctrine from Gnostics. And I don't think this is tenable, Father. And the reason I don't think this is tenable is for one, out of the sources I just read, only two are Gnostic according to mainstream scholarship. All right, only two. And so that means the majority are from uh, mainline Christian sources, which makes it more likely that the Gnostics borrowed it from the mainline Christian sources, not the other way around. And I wasn't naming all anonymous sources. We just named Clement, um, Melito Sardis, um, Hippolytus, Origen, etc. So we're talking about some heavy hitters here. We also see an identical proportion if we look at uh, the earliest prayers to the saints recorded in church history. Now, this is another issue that Protestants don't understand, that a very similar number, 10% of all sources within the first 200 years of church history of Christian authors, because of course there's authors that write more than one source, contain prayers to the saints. And out of 11, all right, of these prayers to the saints, only 
One is from a Gnostic source, and that's even presuming it's actually a prayer to an, uh, to uh, a, a saint. It might not be if you understand Gnostic theology. I'm not going to bore the audience, but just to throw their side a bone, I will I'll I'll grant them that. And so, what's important about these proportions? The importance about these proportions is that it shows that the Gnostics are borrowing veneration of the saints and Marian doctrines from the mainline ortho, proto-Orthodox, if we want to call it that, this is what the scholars say, but from the Orthodox Church, not the other way around. Otherwise, these numbers wouldn't be so disproportionate. Um, if people want to, I, I won't make the whole show, I, I could name the sources for the, with the, the early prayers, but for our purposes, the proportions are identical. And so we have to understand to have that many sources and those that high percentage when we have barely any prayers um, out, you know, preserved. We have barely any hymns preserved um, because so many sources in the first 200 years are apologetic centered. To have these proportions indicates to, I think, anyone dealing honestly the evidence that the veneration of the saints is very early. We have these sources stretching into the first century, so it's almost certainly apostolic if we're speaking historically. Of course, we as Orthodox Christians know by faith that they're, they're apostolic, but I'm trying to argue to those who don't accept the teaching of the church that historically speaking, they're almost certainly apostolic. And if we see it from uh, that light, how else could we conclude that other than that the Theotokos was extremely important right from the beginning, all right? And, and that's what I want people to walk away understanding is that two is important right from the beginning. And just so people know, you could also find prayer saints in Jewish sources during that same time period, including First Enoch 9.3. Now, um, if you're ready, I could I could start unpacking precisely these Marian doctrines in the scriptures in the early church, um, unless you want to interject, Father. No, go ahead. And so, I think this is something important because this is where I think sides could pat could speak past each other. But a presupposition the Orthodox has have is a biblical one. Jude one three speaks that the faith has been delivered once and for all. So there there are no new doctrines. We don't get to lay back and philosophize how many angels could dance on a head of a needle. And, and then if we get the right inferential reasoning laid out, then that becomes the answer. We can only comment on what we have received, what is apostolic. We, we don't devise new doctrines, even if they're eminently logical or something. That's just not how we do theology. And so the apostles have bequeathed to us the scriptures. They're our earliest relevant sources to this question. And the scriptures teach that the saints have intercessory power. We can see this in Revelation 6.10, Mark 12.25, Revelation 8.3, 2 Kings 5.26, Matthew 27.47. It's if you just took for granted what the whole Christian world took for granted until the Protestant Reformation, which is the saints are venerated. We pray to the saints and they intercede for us. No one would see those scriptures and and be confused that that's what they're talking about. They've only become confusing because the presumption has become that these are purely traditional doctrines with no bearing in the scripture whatsoever, which is just not true. These are apostolic doctrines and they are in their scriptures. I also think that a consistent and profound interpretation of scriptures demands marrying readings of some pretty obvious stuff. Now, I think a lot of the audience that follows you would be well aware of some of these. So just bear with us. It's gonna really help us unpack it. We're gonna learn some new things. And so, for example, the it's kind of a, a trope because so people, so many people know about it, is that the Ark of the Covenant is a type of the Theotokos, because she'd be the prototype, she's the real thing. And really the best evidence for this is 2 Samuel 6, 9. And I'm just gonna use that because that's what the most most people have from their Bible on their shelf will just say 2 Samuel 6, 9 and Luke 143. And it's intentional that when the Ark is talked about and when um, the Theotokos is talked about by the Archangel Gabriel, they're using the same exact words because that's the connection they're drawing. But it gets even more profound than that. That's what usually people hear. Here's what they don't usually hear, which is in Luke 135, the Archangel tells um, the Theotokos that the Holy Spirit will overshadow her. And that Greek word overshadow is the identical Greek word for the overshadowing of the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 40, 29 in the Septuagint. 
identical Greek word. It's it's different for tense, but the point is it's the same word. You know, St. Luke wasn't putting this by mistake. And so there's a connection with the purification of the Theotokos and the purification of the Ark, which we have to pay attention to because this comes out in all the hagiographies and all the patristics on this, because again, all the fathers have done is preserve the apostolic doctrine that was delivered once and for all, hmm. right? If, if the fathers all got something wrong and garbled the apostolic doctrine, then how would we get this back, right? This doesn't make sense to the Orthodox. And so this is one thing we have to keep in the back of our mind talking about this issue, but being that the title of the show has to do with Immaculate Conception, we have to talk about original sin. Now, I think thankfully, this is where uh, Roman Catholics, Protestants and Orthodox at least could all say we have some sort of doctrine of original sin. Uh, people very often hear the term ancestral sin, just so people are aware, it's canonically the same thing. So like if you read the Latin canons of Carthage, it would say original sin. If you read the Greek translation of those canons, it'd say ancestral, ancestral sin. If you read the Confession of Decithius um, in the Latin, because they made a Latin and Greek in the 17th century, it'll say original sin. If you read it in Greek, it'll say ancestral sin. So I'll just say original sin is what I'm used to. And so it makes more sense to others. But ancestral sin is the same thing. It doesn't mean will mean the same thing, but from a lot of these things. But with the doctrine of original sin, we see this in the scriptures. It's the origin of death and the passions. And we see this in Romans 5 and Romans 7. Now, these things are not according to human nature, right? Like that we have original sin, because otherwise human nature would have been irreparably harmed. And it talks about this in Decree 6, the Confession to Scythius, which uh, is in the Council of Jerusalem 1672. So they don't really we we say nature in the english language you could read scholarly translations of the fathers and they'll even use the word nature but i think for our purposes and i and i think father it'd be good if you interject they they apply to the human tropos and i'm gonna let people that pronounce greek better than me say that better than me so the best i could tran you know understand that term it's the manner in which nature operates you know the way it operates that is the tropos yes um and so uh I could get a little more into that, how the scriptures bear, bear into that, but I think people haven't heard that before, Father. I don't know if you have anything to add about that. No, I think it's really important that we're not, and that's how the elder is is, is understanding it as well, in, in my understanding. So that, that we're unpacking here, not just uh, your uh, research, but actually the elder, when he talks about a different human nature, he's not talking about that there, you know, there was a change to some other being, but that the way in which uh that that nature the tropos the way is, is or manner is how we would translate tropos you know if i saw toff and ro and you know i saw the letters laid out it'd be easier for me to pronounce i'm starting to get used to that because i'm doing some greek with my son but it, again i could read letters not words so much but th that being said it's because it's the tropos that's affected it's Nature in usual Orthodox dialogue has to do with substance essence. But like if we're talking to a Calvinist, they talk about sin nature all the time. No one would be confused. Sometimes nature does get used in that sense, at least in English translation. So people should be aware of that. Um, and so I think what is part of us speaking past each other in this issue is that the Orthodox doctrine of the atonement is much more well-rounded than the Western version. And so like the debate becomes, do you believe in substitutionary atonement or don't you? And that's all that people care about. But the atonement begins at the incarnation. His incarnation, his life, the resurrection undo everything that's been wronged by Adam and that defective tropos that we've inherited from him. Okay. And so Christ, by being incarnated completely sinless with the intact tropos, his life being completely intact, never sinning, his death not having to die, we'll get into this, his voluntary death, while because of our tropos we have to die, he didn't have to die, he voluntarily dies, canceling the law of death, and then he resurrects, he conquers death. This totally undoes the tropos that Adam had given us. Right. And so that's why the Orthodox doctrine is so much more well-rounded and it all connects to this doctrine of original sin, which is why we 
really can't talk about the Theotokos and these hagiographic details without really understanding this is a complete package for us. It's not like you could put the Theotokos in the shelf here and then pick up something else, uh, Christology, and then talk about it. They're, they're a complete package. Now, in the scriptures, 1 Peter 1.18 speaks that mankind is ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors. All right? And the word feudal ways, uh, in a lot of, like, this is a New King James Version. Um, I'm not going to pronounce it so great, Father, in the Greek, but I think it's anastrophes. <laughs> you know? Anastrophes. Yeah. Okay. My yeah. translation says manner of life. You as a you speak yeah. Greek, so is that, a, is that a, a good translation? Yeah. Yeah. And so Christ ransom us from a manner of living, from a defective tropos, right? Mm. So like you read it in English, you don't really, you're not connecting these dots, but this is here in the actual scriptures, which are in Greek, and even like the feudal ways that English translation, it's, it's not terrible, right? It's a, it's a way of living. He didn't just, it's not like there were like Protestants say, these debts, these demerits, and, and Christ is, uh, in, you know, imputed righteousness and imputed sin to him. It's like, no, he corrected an actual defect in how our nature operated. It's more well-rounded than that. And that's in the scriptures. Um, so anyhow. Well, and it points a little bit to to the question of synergy in salvation. Yes, I think, absolutely. Right? Which is huge and not understood by many. So synergy is a Greek word for basically cooperation or working the same energy action operation that is together, right? That's united. I think this points also to that, which is at the heart of our, our soteriology. It, absolutely. If anyone who studies the, the seventh century Christological controversies, for example, can't help but walk away and see that the pointed issue that St. Maximus teaches is that human nature, human nature now, the substance, essence, before the fall, always reflexively did the will of God, right? We were designed to synergize. It's the fallen tropos where then we don't do that. And we're going to get more into that. But that's why this is all connected, right? Because what Christ is restoring is actual human nature as it's supposed to be without, with an intact tropos, mm. right? Mm. It's like having the correct software on the PCM of your vehicle for all the car okay. car fans out there. And this, so this is going <laughs> to go back to the basic patristic teaching about the katikone uh, keomiusin, the likeness, the, the image and likeness eventually, right? So that's going to be really important. And understanding because if you have a total blackened and darkened and done away with image not just a loss of a likeness well then a, a correction of in in the tropos is not going to be salvific there's got no, to be something and, to work with and, and that's why we will take major issue with some of the things that the that western christianity considers not sinful and like no yes this is part of the fall because otherwise if it's not then that's that's internally encoded in human nature and so we're, we're going to get that's yeah. that's so good. important it's so good, good that you brought that up father um and so christ being that he is pristine human nature he has pristine human nature that's what he assumed um in the virgin um that he was not subject to having a fallen trouble he did not have to live a fallen life pain um you know hunger in these things he voluntarily assumed it as not being guilty of sin and the scriptures and fathers are clear about this like so for example in john 19 30 it says that bowing his head he gave up his spirit right he bowed his head and then he gave up his spirit he had to voluntarily die um romans 8 3 speaks of christ being made in the likeness of sinful flesh not that he had sinful flesh he was sinless um and so he did this so that those who are guilty of sin, who involuntarily, us, right, inherited the manner of life from Adam, may have this inheritance undone and healed. And right, and this is how our atonement works. Well, how could it be undone unless we cooperate with the grace of God, unless we synergize with him, right? Mm -hmm. It's all a complete package. You can't pick one thing off the shelf and then hold on to the, and then keep the other thing on the shelf. It's mm -hmm. orthodoxy is a complete package. They all connect. Now, the church's hagiographies for the Theotokos recorder death, assumption, and they presume upon the anthropology we just discuss as being applicable to her. I mean, this this is the only scholarly thing that I'm actually publishing in, in Orthodox. I've written all sorts of blog posts and stuff, but like this is what actually I'm published in, is particularly that topic, is that you can't understand these hagiographies, divorce and the Christology. In fact, a lot of these people writing these hagiographies 
were in the midst of Christological controversy, like St. Maximus and even the Monophysites were doing, they were all doing the same stuff. Now, what are some details in these hagiographies we have to be mindful of because they're going to have anthropological and thereby Christological implications? Mm -hmm. Well, one of them is that they make reference to toll houses. And they also point out Christ was exempt from these toll houses and that Theotokos wasn't. Well, I mean, what's the significance of this? Christ having intact tropos, he would have nothing to accuse. It's not just committing sins, you know, it's a tragic thing, but children die, infants die, right? They, you know, they enjoy salvation if they're baptized in the church. And whether they are baptized or they're not, the point is, if they have original sin, there there is judgment. And so it's not like, oh, well, the Theotokos, she's sinless. Well, how could you be judged? Well, the same applies to infants. And the, the, and the confession of Dositheus talks about this. And so it's, it's a detail that's important. And it's a detail because accusations of sin doesn't mean she committed sin, but it's something that only someone that could be accused of committing sin could ha will have to deal with. Now, mm -hmm. tradition also states that the Theotokos, by God's grace, was completely exempt from having to pass through those toll houses. So we don't actually say that she went through the toll houses. That's not that's not the hagiographic tradition. The point is, she was mindful of apart from grace that she'd have to. All right, that's what comes up in the hagiographies. Now another detail that comes up in in countless saints in the hagiographies is they speak about the Theotokos' grief and doubts. Um, grief being a blameworthy passion. People don't think of this, but the book of Revelation says there'll be no more tears in heaven. We should hope that grief is not part of an intact tropos, right? Mm. So so grief is something that's part of a fallen tropos. Mm. It does not pre-exist the fall. And doubts pertain to gnomic will. Um, and that also comes after the fall. It's There's a whole patristic analysis, analysis of Genesis 3, 6, but I'm just going to get very bare bones here. Gnomic willing, in short, is a deliberative faculty. Should I do it? Should I not? Is it good? Is it bad? It's, it's just not knowing reflexively what's good, what's wrong. And it doesn't mean you know everything. It means that by, by nature, an attack tropos will always do God's will. They won't have to deliberate what God's, what God's will is. The moment, apart from deception, it hears God's will, an attacked person, not fallen, will do God's will. This stuff that St. Maximus talks about, Roman Catholic scholars like Dr. Benjamin Heidegger are, are well aware of this. So this is not just something that comes up in apologetics. This is mainstream stuff. Now, before the, before the fall, Adam and Eve were good, but they were inclined only to do God's will and not consider evil. Now, this is not my opinion. That St. Gregory Anissa on The Making of Man in chapter 20 said that man would not have been deceived by manifest evil. That's why Satan deceived Eve. Because if he said, do this because it's bad, it would have had zero appeal. He had to say, this is good. Because an intact tropos can only choose goods, hmm. right? There, there's, there's no sin and no gnomic willing where, you, where you're going to be deciding, well, maybe I'll do good, maybe I'll do bad. That doesn't exist. Hmm. All right. So the fact that the Theotokos could doubt already poses these anthropological issues if we understand patristic anthropology. Now, th there's an even earlier source on this. And this is St. Irenaeus in Demonstration of the Apostolic Preaching, paragraph 14. Just so people are aware, St. Irenaeus wrote this because he wanted to write it down before the oral tradition of the apostles would be lost for good, <laughs> right? So this is the oral tradition of the apostles written down. And he, he records for us this, that Adam and Eve had no comprehension and understanding of things that are base. No comprehension, right? They couldn't conceive of evil. It wasn't possible in that state. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of there being no gnomic willing um in in human nature before the fall is not something saint maximus made up he was he was being faithful and clarifying the earliest apostolic tradition um that's recorded now we, there's some more in this what i want to unpack as well like saint gregory nissa and on the making a man in um chapter 27 paragraph 5 speaks of uh human nature being not subject to flux and change right no deliberation we get confused saint Irenaeus. And the aforementioned book in paragraph 11, a uh, paragraph 11 says that Adam and Eve were free and self-controlled. Um, saint Theophilus of Antioch, by the way, another mid-century, second century saint, 
also makes comments on the gnomic will. So this is a very early doctrine, sinful inclination and confusion, such as contemplating sin or even not knowing who God is. Like, how can you doubt who God is when by nature you're inclined to co-energize, synergize with God? Um, that did not pre-exist, the fall. But yet the, uh, the patristic tradition about the Theotokos does say this is something that occurred and something that God healed her from by grace. Okay, and we're going to get into why we don't think that's sin. Because I, I think, Father, Western people thinking of this as Protestants, or I think even some Roman Catholics, I don't know if this is traditional Catholic or not, um, but they hear this and it sounds like you're saying Mary sinned, but that's not how we understand this, right? Sin requires consent of the will. Sin requires um, being tempted and accepting the temptation, not rejecting it. Conscious but, decision for sin. There's, yes, there's this conscious but, decisions. But this is a part of the, the common inheritance for uh, uh, the ancestral sin. That would be what the point, right? A absolutely. Because Christ would, could not be tempted by manifest evil, right? Because he, he was fall, uh, he, he had, he had unfallen flesh, he prelapsarian flesh. Yes. Right. So he couldn't be tempted by that. He couldn't be tempted to doubt the father is the father. You know, he could, but the Theotokos could because they're, because she has the same inheritance we do. But she, as we're going to learn, she's completely overcome that inheritance through God's grace and her perfect cooperation with that grace. She is our prototype of salvation in that sense. It's super important. Now, another early hagiography, the six books Apocryphon, um, identifies the Theotokos as amongst the daughters of Eve. And also speaks of her having have purified herself from all evil thoughts, but also speaks of her vo her voluntary death. So, uh, ironically, um, one scholar told me that oh, you know, voluntary death is this you know late doctrine from the sixth seventh century. I'm like, no, it's in the six books apocryphon, and and this book was translated I think in 1860 <laughs> into English. So this some people really aren't paying attention, but the point is that. We can see in these early hagiographies, they, they acknowledge she's a daughter of Eve. She, right, she didn't consent to evil thoughts. She purified herself, which, guys, I read these, the, the hagiographies and the saints consistently. It's not because she had evil thoughts. It's because she was rejecting any temptation to sin. All right. That's a way of purification, not because she was entertaining those thoughts. God forbid we do not believe that about the Theotokos. And her voluntary death is important because it shows that she attained to a spiritual death, uh, state where death became voluntary. This is very interesting. Now, in that one um, early source, that kind of gives us the full gamut of Marian doctrine. She had original sin. Grace allowed her to overcome the effects of a fallen tropos, including the passions and death. Now, later hagiographies like from St. Maximus get very specific on these issues. And, and I think I'll just I'll dwell on Maximus because he we all respect Maximus. And he's, um, I just, he's more clarified because he's writing this in the midst of the monothelite controversy. And just for all those people that say, oh, well, there's scholarship that doubt that St. Maximus wrote this. One, the scholarship that doubts it credits it to St. Euthymius, um, the, the enlightener of the Georgians. So then just some other saint wrote this. So that's really not problematic for our purposes. And two, the latest scholarship and manuscript evidence all points to St. Maximus. And that's, I've had the uh, honor to read a pre, it's before it's published, an article that'll be published next year uh, by Dr. Stephen Schumacher on that issue, on the manuscripts of the life of the Virgin by St. Maximus. But according to St. Maximus in that book, in page 80 in Schumacher's translation, the Theotokos had grief and doubt that needed healing and consolation from God. Right? So she needed grace in order to overcome grief and doubt. Because again, Orthodox anthropology demands that these are things that precede the fall. Uh, by the way, the, in the preface to questions of Thalassius um, flat out states these are blameworthy passions for those that wonder. Now, page 153 in, in the Schumacher translation, uh, St. Maximus says, She was buried as one of the dead according to the order law of nature. Now, this is interesting because the reason St. Maximus brings this up is not because he doubts her voluntary death, but he's trying to create a contrast between her and the Lord, right? And how does he draw this context, uh, uh, context uh, uh, this contrast? Well, he states that the Theotokos, um, I'm trying to, I have my quotes, I think, in the wrong order here. 
Uh, so if I read later in a second, I'm sorry. But essentially, he says that the Theotokos, by grace, had the laws of nature um, changed for her, right? So she would have died apart from that grace because, again, that fallen tropos. Now, what are the contrasts to St. Maximus draw? Now, we can read this page 101 of his translation. She suffered more than him, that's Christ, and endured sorrows of the heart. For he was God and Lord of all things, and he willingly endured suffering in the flesh. But she possessed the frailty of a human being and a woman, and was filled with such love toward her beloved and desirable son. So to repeat, he willingly endured in the flesh, but she possessed the frailty of a human being. So Christ voluntarily assumed this sinless affects the fall. But the Theotokos, like us, involuntarily inherited these things, right? That's the point of the contrast. This is what St. Maximus is teaching. So likewise, Christ cannot be tempted by um, sinful suggestions. He teaches that he was only tempted by natural goods, not manifest evil. But compared to Theotokos, to quote the Damascene, that she turned her mind away from every secular and carnal desire. We could read about that in Exposition, Book 4, paragraph, uh, Chapter 14. And we see St. John Chrysostom speaking of Christ's grace preempting her from uh, vainglory, for example. doesn't mean that she considered vainglory. By God's grace, she turned from it. But Christ could never have to turn from vainglory because it wasn't possible in his, pre in his prelapsary and human condition. All right. And, th and that's something that is taken for granted in the 7th century, but is lost now. I think a lot of people hearing this, like, I never heard this before because it doesn't come up in discourse very often. But, and so, uh, yes, Greg, Father. Already, already, all of this makes the ideas presented um, in defense of the Immaculate Conception impossible. Of it, course. It, yeah, it's, it's impossible to reconcile what we're hearing with the doctrine and the theology that's developed in the West. And I would say this is extremely enlightening in terms of our ascetic struggle, our hope. Her, She's the great example here. Yes, right? She's the first of many, right after the Lord, and so uh, when you're hearing this, you're hearing about uh, not only you're hearing about soteriology, and you're hearing about our life in Christ. What could be? I mean, she's she. I think Saint Maximus also says that we're all called to be Theotoki somewhere, right? In other words, by grace, spiritually to give birth to Christ. So he he sees her as the as our example, our our leader, the champion leader. So all of that would be impossible if she was the great exception, which is what the Immaculate Conception makes her. And and we'll get to say John Maximovich. He actually laments that you you take you take away her greatest merit. Yes. Uh, I mean, I I appreciate the Doctor Immaculate Conception because I love the Theotokos. Anything that exalts her, let's exalt her. We can't exalt her with words. How holy she is. But the problem with Immaculate Conception is you took one of the things away which we could exalt her for. <laughs> exactly. So it, it's exactly. intolerable to us if you understand proper Christology, proper anthropology, proper soteriology. It's a complete package. Yes, you know, I, I interrupted um, you, but continue because this is very, very, very uh, um, upbuilding. And, 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 and just so you know, Father, St. Gregory Palmas and, and St. Nicholas Cavacillus are right there with you. They, they drew those explicit connections that you were drawing. Great. And so... I just like for the people that are impious, to be clear, none of these things mean that the Theotokos entertained any such sin, but that Satan tempted her with blameworthy passions, which she rejected. All right. That, that's all the Orthodox position is. She never conceived of anything sinful, is uh, St. Saint, uh, um, Saint, uh, Nikolai Zika says. Right. So she's not conceiving of things that are sinful. Um, she's tempted by things and by grace she's able to overcome this because we need grace in this is super this important as well in the spiritual life because how many people have awful thoughts identify though with those thoughts as if they're generated from themselves as opposed Great to point. understanding them as them from outside so that distinction is often lost in the spiritual life and then they own those thoughts as if yeah. they're their own and they drive them to despair and all the rest so again a huge hugely important uh, uh, spiritual, I'd say, doctrine here about the spiritual life for us. Oh, yeah. See, I mean, St. Maximus all over the place in that. Uh, I'm going to blow people's minds, but there's not a single bad thing you ever thought of that was really your idea. It's always the demons, <laughs> and, and that's the <laughs> teaching of the saints. Yeah. Not a single bad thing. And it's not the devil made you do it. You, you could synergize with God or you could synergize with the devil. Make your choice.
So, just so people know, Christ was never tempted with blameworthy passions. In fact, uh, St. John the Dam Damascus is very explicit about this in Exposition Orthodox Faith, Book 3, Chapter 20. Now, the point is not whether she entertained these things and when we deal with this issue, the Immaculate Conception, but that she could have due to her tropos, right? And that's an impossibility for Christ, right? So, like, when we're saying this, it's we're, what we're trying to state is that she had the capacity for it. Eve did it before the fall, Christ did it, but she had that capacity because she shared the same condition we do, right? That's, that's the orthodox doctrine. Now, this is not bad because it actually undoes Eve. Let me point this out for you guys. Mm -hmm. Eve was born in a state without passions and without gnomic will, and she voluntarily opted into them. Now, the second Eve was born in a state with passions and gnomic will and voluntarily opted out of them. To the mm -hmm. point that she overcame death, she overcame them entirely. This is the so glory. it's the exact foil, the exact, uh, the exact economy. It's exactly different. This is the great glory of that. That that's why she's crowned. If she doesn't have this, she's not crowned. So important. It, 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 absolutely, it's like you're taking away literally her chief role in salvation history, the Immaculate Conception. The devil has been doing this for seven thousand years. He's he's very wily. He's not stupid. <laughs> and the Immaculate Conception, in, in some sense, is one of the most uh, clever covers for something, if you understand Orthodox doctrine, is that it's extremely impious. Mm. Now, um, what I don't want people to understand also, because I know you have some Protestants and acquirers that, that follow this channel, is that the reason she overcame death is not because she wasn't human. She became so divinized that she was able to voluntarily die and be assumed by grace. She was not resurrected. That's why it's the assumption of Mary. Because Christ is resurrected because his human nature couldn't die. He voluntarily died. And by his own capacity, he rose himself. As he even says, right? Um, I give Knock down this temple and three days I'll rise it up, right? So mm -hmm. it's something he's doing. So... Schumacher, like that quote I was ham handling before, page 136 translation, says, well, then how did Mary um, die? Um, how did she actually voluntarily die? St. Maximus says, the king and lord of nature's altered the course of nature, right? Because she couldn't do so according to be having a prelapsary nature. It was by grace, right? He altered the course of nature, the course of tropos, not her human nature, guys. Let's St. Maximus wasn't a, a, a heretic. They didn't know, you know, didn't know that they're seeing substance and essence and all these things, right? So there's that word nature popping itself up again, the same way that it came up in Elder Gregory's um, Elder that quote. Elder <laughs> so, so we see it again. Um, now this contrast, so it says about Christ, according to St. Maximus, Christ avoided drinking wine mixed with myrrh, so that they would not be able to attribute his sudden and quick death to the poison instead of his own will and consent. So you see that dichotomy that's drawn? The Theotokos voluntarily dies because Christ altered nature. Christ purposely avoided anything that can make it look like he was poisoned or something. So it would be clear that his own will and consent is what causes that, right? Mm -hmm. This is absolutely central and just never gets talked about, but this is so essential to orthodox yeah, doctrine uh restate that and double down on that because uh, let's make sure everybody gets that that's really the, the quote from saint maximus yes and this idea here that you're that that, you're, that, that again that, that between christ and the most and the theotokos now the theotokos right she died voluntarily but because of grace god altered the course of nature it's a quote from maximus now christ for example he died voluntarily he avoided drinking the wine mixed with myrrh to quote saint maximus so they would not be able to attribute a sudden and quick death to the poison instead of his own will and consent, right? So the point is Christ could voluntarily die, but it's by grace because otherwise she would have had to die. Christ has to voluntarily die by his own will and consent because it was actually impossible for him to die because he was sinless. He voluntarily opted into the blameless passions and corruption and death. Now, just so people, that's not apthartodocetism. Apthartodocetus rejected that Christ had blameless passions. Christ most definitely voluntarily opted to blameless passions. And he actually did corrupt hey, because that's unpack, a result of blameless passions. You have to unpack for people what the blameless passions are because I don't think they're... All right, so blameless passions are... See, like the West just has concupiscence, and right? So they think like when you talk about concupiscence or have you really pronounce it, I, I have awful pronunciation of these things, that like sexual thoughts and you know and angry thoughts and 
And they just think like, well, of course, like Christ didn't voluntarily assume that. But when we say passions, we are not just saying that, that like sexual thoughts and these things, those would be blameworthy passions. Mm. The blameless passions are like hunger, tiredness, like pain in your neck, right? They're the result of the fall. They're passions, right? Like the even had these things until she partook of the fruit. Um, but they're not, like, they don't make you a bad person. Like you don't go to hell because your neck hurts. <laughs> if that, if that helps put it really simple, yeah. I don't know if you, you want to add anything to that father, maybe a little more profound. Well, it shows that he, his humanity without sin, without sin, it's, it's, it's very important. It, exactly. So like blameless passions are not the effects of sin, right? Blameless passions are in effect the, like an actual it's it's not just an effect it's like a cause and effect if that makes sense like it's a combined thing while blameless passions he only opted into um the effects of sin that have nothing to do with actually c conducting sin because christ was to quote hebrews 4 15 he was tempted in every way which we are but without sin right everyone leaves off but without sin right christ wasn't tempted by sexual thoughts you know so in impious things like the, like thoughts like that, you know, he was tempted in every which we are, but without sin because he was sinless and he couldn't be tempted. It was right. constitutionally impossible because remember what we read in, in St. Irenaeus and St. Gregory and Issa, manifest evil does not tempt prelapsarian human nature, uh, human nature for the fall. And that's what Christ had. He can only be tempted in every which we are, but without sin. So very important thing for people to understand. And as, again, like I point out, right? Orthodox doctrine is apostolic. That's why it's in the scriptures. It's not something that just pops up in the Middle Ages. It's in the earliest of fathers. It's in the earliest recorded um, apost recorded apostolic tradition. St. Irenaeus wrote the oral tradition down. The, the, this stuff is from the beginning. Great, let's go. Let's keep going. Now, um, and so because St. Maximus wrote all these things and we were getting so much into Christology, during the month of late controversy, um, this doctrine's import, right? Marian doctrine's chief importance, why they're writing it down, is its effect in Christological doctrine. Yeah. All right. Um, she is his mother, after all. She's the mother of God. So you, you would think these things are necessarily connected. Now, but it's, with not, the, it's not an accident that almost every icon we have in the Orthodox Church has her holding Christ and pointing always to Christ. And, and then, it, and, and every other icon has a halo, which is the grace of God. So God's always with her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's always about God. It's always about God. Yeah. Now, um, I want to avoid typical response video genre where you're, you're always making reference to um, here would be Michael Lofton because it because of the negativity and the sort of like it turns this into football or MMA, which it shouldn't be. This is not competitive sports. And so I'm going to focus on some of the concerns he brings up and objections he brings up. And some of these are his own personal objections. And so you can't say every Roman Catholic believes this or he can't change his mind or, or whatever. We're just gonna go with what was stated because I think a lot of people were concerned and we're gonna just stick with the arguments and the points and the concerns and take it from there. Um, but that's that's where they come, come from. And as you brought up earlier, Father, um, the, the point of concern was that quote from Father George, and I, I can't pronounce Grigorio. Uh, how do you Gr say that? Father? Grigorio. 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 Uh -huh. Again, it's if monastery. It's, it's a monastery, it's, he's the abbot of. Pronouncing this stuff in English is like impossible because our letters don't have the same phonetics, right? I see, like in the Greek, it makes more sense, but I don't have that in front of me. So, anyway, that quote states if the virgin possessed a different nature, I'm going to add in brackets, as Roman Catholics allege. Then the Lord taking on human nature from her divinized um, some other nature and not the nature common to all men. And so the concern is that this accuses Roman Catholics of believing if Mary had a different human usia. But as we were unpacking, nature could be another, it's just a reference to tropos in, in this context. So the elders critique is that Roman Catholics teach Mary did not share the same fallen tropos we have. Well, why is this important? Because that's a mandatory, a mandatory confession for every Orthodox bishop. And by the way, 
also the Uniates, because they use the same service book. I'm going to pronounce it wrong because the English, English is terrible. The great Eucolygians, how it's spelt in English. Uh, Father, what's Eucolygian in, in Greek? Because we're laughing <laughs> about that. F Cologion, F Cologion. Yeah, F Cologion. It's not even close. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. it's again, so the Uniates have this too. So every Uniate bishop says this because, you know, the Uniates were once Orthodox. So what, what must they confess to be a bishop? I confess the word of God, co eternal with the Father, being above time, uncircumscribed, unconfined, yet came down to our nature and humbled himself as man and took our whole fallen human nature from the pure and virginal blood of the only immaculate and pure virgin. All right. Our whole fallen human nature. Right. So we would hope that we're not accusing the Orthodox bishops or the Union bishops that they're confessing that there's a defective human nature and there's like a good human nature. They're talking about tropos, right? That's the context of this. And so if the Theotokos possess an unfallen nature, then Christ did not assume our whole fallen human nature as the, um, as the confession demands. And so all that um, Elder, uh, Elder Gregory is saying George. is... Elder George. Elder George, sorry, I'm saying Gregory and this is so much. Elder George is saying is what is like par for the course for every cleric that's a bishop for like since the eighth century. At least that's our oldest copy of this prayer. It's probably from before then. So like this is just like common sense stuff if you understand the Orthodox tradition. Well, it isn't the basic Christology that if he has not assumed it, he has not saved it. I mean, that was the whole point of the in the Christological controversies was basic uh response to the to the uh to those who are who are doubting his he assumed a human nature well, it, it's so. an absolute just like from first peter 118 christ had to undo our whole manner of living right and so the theotokos had fallen flesh right but it instantly as it was assumed because christ assumed human nature human flesh into the divine hypostasis the word of god right he assumes human nature the instant it was assumed it's instantly transformed into blameless human flesh, blame, uh, flesh without a fallen tropos. So instantly, the moment Christ entered the world, the human condition was healed. Mm -hmm. Instantly, right? So that's why this incarnational reality is so important. And once yeah. you come up, and if you have an immaculate conception, you actually destroy the atonement. It, it's, it's so important because that's how the atonement works. It starts with the incarnation. And if you don't have the incarnation correcting the fallen human tropos, then how how is our tropos ever corrected if there wasn't a man that completely voluntarily assumed all the effects of the fallen tropos that were blameless and without sin but otherwise didn't have the fallen tropos as a restoration of the original adam and that's what christ is mm. so it's so important yes now another issue that came up is he there's a definition of the immaculate conception that is given but it's not in the actual Immaculate Conception, so it's, but I'll just quote what was said. The quote is, there was never a time Mary was estranged from God. So that's that's not in the 1854 definition. And this is really an emotional argument. It's sort of like, are you saying there's a time that Mary didn't know God, that the Theotokos could have went to hell, she died young, or, or some sort of impious speculation, which like, who dreams up of these things? Um, and all I can say is she was predestined, right? She was foreknown and directed by grace to salvation from the foundation of the world, the Theotokos would be the mother of God. We need right? to unpack predestined though, not in a Calvinistic way. Well, because God foreknew precisely yes. the holiness of the ancestors of St. Joachim and Anna, their disp dispassionate conception of the Theotokos, that this dispassionately conceived uh, woman would always cooperate with the grace of God, that she would never con uh, consent to sin, right? That's why God chose her, because he foreknew everything. It's yeah, not that she didn't do everything. Yeah, Christ didn't make her better. do it. She synergized yes. with God. Yes, yes. Foreknew is a better term than predestination because of the implications of Christology and anthropology and all this. But yes, I, 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 it's a perfectly I, good term. I'm, I'm sorry, Father. It's just 
I want to take our Romans eight back from the Calvinist, yeah. right? <laughs> it's our word, right? And I, I want to term, take Ephesians chapter yeah. one back from the Calvinist. Yeah. But yeah, when we're speaking of foreknowledge yes. and God foreknows who will uh, respond positively yeah. to his grace. And he gives the proportion of grace, like the scriptures say, each are given a measure of faith. He gives the proportion of grace, which he knows we will adequately respond to because God desires the salvation of all men. Just like those whom he hardens is because if he would give grace, they would have had greater fall. They would be guilty of rejecting even more grace. So yes. that's a whole thing, predestination. Yes, yes, but that's yes, what yes, I'm yes. talking about. Okay, good. And so anyway, <laughs> um, so understanding that, and that's why I wanted to use the word predestination in the orthodox sense, that if we understand that there is no way to speculate what would happen if she died in some absurd way without removing a central premise of her soteriological condition. Mm -hmm. So how could I say, how was there ever a time she was estranged from God where for that to be possible would be to remove the central premise of a soteriological condition that God foreknew from the beginning of the world, this is who she would be. Yeah. That's why he chose her, right? So the, the objection doesn't make sense seen in that light. Now, we also have to be mindful of the saints. The saints don't locate her conception as the exact moment that resolved all enmity with the devil. Now, the quote St. Augustine, and this is in Against Julianus, Book 4, Paragraph 122. It's only in the Latin, by the way. The English translation doesn't have this matching paragraph number. It states, We do not deliver Mary to the devil by condition of her birth, but for this reason, because this very condition resolved by the grace of rebirth. Right? So her spiritual baptism. Now, we also see, and just so people are aware, well, I'll get into this. This has to do with the Annunciation. Now, St. Gregory, the Illuminator, Homily Theory in the Annunciation, he quotes a uh, apocryphal conversation between the uh, angel Gabriel and the Theotokos. No longer shall the devil be against you, for where of old that adversary inflicted the wound, i.e. in the womb, there now, first of all, does the physician apply the salve of deliverance. Now, let me repeat that. No longer shall the devil be against you, but in the womb, now, there, the physician applies a salve of deliverance, right? So the Annunciation, the grace of the Annunciation was a sort of healing for her. We're going to unpack what that means. It doesn't mean she had sinned before then. Where death came forth, there was life now prepared its entrance, right? So death came from us being born, uh, Psalm 50 speaks that uh, we we have sin uh, from our mother. Well, from that, from our from the womb, from the Theotokos, from that mother, now life comes forth. So, right, it's this undoing of original sin. Now, and again, this undoing doesn't work if you don't have this sort of dichotomy purposely drawn, which is so much of Orthodox theology or these like these mirror images against each other. Now, again, to make clear, the Theotokos never in thought or deed sinned. She never conceived of sin in her mind. And by God's grace, she rejected every temptation to sin. God's grace was with her from conception, by the way. All right. So she, she's had increasing grace from conception and being presented the temple and so on and so forth. But none of this means that the Theotokos was born with an intact prelapsarian tropos. This would defy the incarnational aspect of the atonement confessed in the great Eucolygian. I'll use the English <laughs> pronunciation. Now, salvation is on a spectrum and grace is applied diversely. People need to understand this. Right? There's many mansions in heaven. There's many different, we attain to different levels of grace. So people could attain to heaven without theosis in this life. There's saints that like didn't see the uncreated light, but they are in heaven. Or undoing all the effects of sin. So the example would be that in the hagiographies, there's saints with voluntary deaths and saints with involuntary deaths. Now, a lot of Western Christians aren't even aware they're saints uh, that voluntarily died, but there's actually a whole ton of them that voluntarily died. Um, so we see there are people that go to heaven without attaining to the state of utter spiritual perfection, like those who voluntarily die. So, right, like you don't need utter spiritual perfection to go to heaven, and it sure helps, but I don't think anyone listening to this or you and I, Father, are going to attain to utter spiritual perfection this life. And so for the Theotokos, the moment of utter spiritual perfection was obviously the Annunciation. Why? Because God became flesh in her. That's the full dose of theosis. Doesn't get any more God than that, right? Yeah. Like it's, she actually had God incarnate in her, right? So we'll be divinized by God's grace, by his, by his energies, 
but we're not going to have like God made of our flesh. We can even consume his flesh and blood as we do in the Eucharist. But like God is not going to be made of us. She had the full dose of theosis. Mm. So that's why the saints focus on the Annunciation. That's what completely undoes the enemy of the devil. And so the objection removes so much force from what the Orthodox doctrine is, which is why we would find the objection objectionable. Um, I hope laying it out like that kind of makes sense of it all for the audience. Well, and if I might interject something. Yes, Father. The, you know, uh, salvation, grace, I think people talk about grace, but there's probably a lot of different ideas here tonight. People listening, what is grace? What is grace? But grace is God himself and unity and communion in him. And so another way to say this, there's a spectrum of that, obviously. And there, the, the, it doesn't get any, as you said, any more intense or any more uh, full, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. I mean, that's that's where we're now arrived at a state that certainly can it surpasses Eve by a long, a long shot. Right. So so in 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 understanding our salvation and you know uh the mother of god here that i think is really important to unpack the meaning of grace because it, it i think a lot of people think of it in, in legalistic moralistic terms uh so hopefully and just so people are aware ephesians chapter 3 and wisdom of solomon chapter 11 does speak of grace in exactly those terms this is this is not some sort of um medieval orthodox idea again we just the faith has been delivered once and for all we're just preserving and clarifying that deposit of faith very good now there's another accusation of orthodox uh misrepresenting uh roman catholics believing that the theotokos never died and this was something that actually made me raise an eyebrow because he made a good argument and i want to maybe show there's a little more to this issue now, what we have to, both sides must concede, that there's many mainstream scholars um, that are Roman Catholics in good standing that are, lack of a better term, Marian immortalists. Now, this includes Father Martin Yugi, who actually direct input on the definition of the Assumption of Mary in 1950. Now, the quote Schumacher in the Ancient Traditions of the Virgin Mary's Dormition and Assumption, page 17, he says, because of Martin Yugi specifically, because of his input, the 1950 definition deliberately left open the question of the virgin's actual death, right? And so for us Orthodox where she had to die, that's a, that's a necessary part of our tradition. It's not necessary, unlike what uh, the objection to us states, it's not necessary for the Roman Catholics. I mean, this is even something that comes up by one of the people instrumental in the definition of that dogma in Father Martin Yugi, which by the way, uh, they're very fond of quoting and following his scholarship because his scholarship is really all the stuff that you see in Father Christian Cops. People want to know. Now, just so people go, well, because by the way, Father Martin Yuki is only in French and Latin. Well, oh, you know, maybe Schumacher's wrong, you know, you know, Schumacher is the eminent Marian scholar alive right now, and he will be for some time. He's pretty young. To quote um, a 1951 scholar, so you don't get like too much closer to the definition of the assumption. Um, Kaspar Friedhoff, all right, so I'm going to quote a Roman Catholic scholar. Says, if Mary did die, then this privilege includes an anticipated glorious resurrection. I say, if she did die. Historically, there's no evidence of that death. There have been and are, because obviously in 1951, Father Martin Yuki and Anton Wegner were still alive, um, theologians of the opinion that she never died. So I will, I would say I share Lofton's conviction when he read paragraph 20 of the 1950 definition of the assumption that uh, he, that yes, you know, it's good to believe that the Theotokos died. Like, amen. I mean, that's, that's what the Orthodox believe. But I think it's important to recognize that contemporaries understood that document, that of, of leaving that question open, that paragraph 20 was giving just one allowable opinion, not the only opinion. Otherwise, you would not have Father Martin Yugi, you wouldn't have Friedhoff, you wouldn't have guys alive at the time, instrumental in the definition of that dogma, saying otherwise, right? So that doesn't come up because I just don't think people have read enough of the scholarship and know enough about this um but at least now it has come up and they could be aware 
Now, there's another objection that says that the Immaculate uh, Conception, he says, permits the Theotokos to have some consequences of Adam's fall, such as sorrow. And uh, I think it was Catholic Encyclopedia that was quoted on this. And for the Orthodox, we can't accept this. We can't accept that someone without sin, um, completely without sin, with no original sin, would have sorrow. Now, sorrow, grieving for oneself, is a blame is a blameworthy passion. It's not a blameless passion. Um, now, the fathers deny that Christ had sorrow. Now, I'm going to deal with some pretty low-level objections. Like people say, well, isn't Christ a man of sorrows? Well, look at the Hebrew. That's not actually what Isaiah 53 3 says. Look at the Septuagint translating it and giving us the meaning of the Hebrew there as well. Um, Christ assumed our pains is actually what I say, not really sorrows. Like he didn't assume our depression. Uh, people also point to the famous Jesus wept. But if you read the fathers on Jesus wept, they speak of Christ weeping out of empathy, right? Not because he was actually distraught, right? Because grief and sorrow is not part of his condition. That's why St. Maximus was contrasting the Theotokos weakness and her grief and why she needed healing and consolation with Christ, just voluntarily assuming pain and death, right? He didn't assume sorrow. It's a, it's a blameworthy passion. Now, I don't want people... I, I, this may be good for you to interject, Father, because this is pastoral, but th the point of this is not for you to be despondent if you ever get sad, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, if you re repent and you pray to your guardian angel, angel for positive thoughts, it's one of the prayers of the guardian angel, if you focus on all the blessings God has, if you repent from despondency, you actually do righteousness, right? Mm -hmm. Repenting from sin is righteous. You'll get rewards for heaven repenting from sin. So the point is, if you get depressed, you have sorrow, you have grief, um, I'm not saying that makes you a bad person. I'm just saying we have to anthropologically understand where this fits because it's relevant to the question at hand. I don't know if there's something you want to add there, Father. Well, absolutely. I mean, this is uh, our condition is not uh, the, the Lord or the Mother of God. So we're on we're on the path of repentance. And so weeping for our sins is uh, is cathartic and essential. Uh, may, may, may we not have a hard heart, but actually uh, have sorrow for our sins and for the sins of the world not not doubt in in the lord's love that's uh, not that would be the opposite yeah good to doubt ourselves sometimes but not god yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's for sure the there's another objection which i found disconcerting that the orthodox reject their own saints uh who allegedly believe the immaculate conception out of spite and I, there's no evidence of this. I don't know if someone says out of spite because I refuse to believe in the papacy. I reject the Immaculate Conception. I, I don't think there's anyone who says that. And the evidence that was brought forth was an article from Father Lev Gillette, which I'm sure I'm pronouncing wrong because it's French. And I want people to understand because I've actually read the article that it does not quote a single Orthodox saint um, teaching the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Not one. doesn't quote it. And so to use this article, which doesn't quote an Orthodox saint to teach the, the, doc, uh, the doctrine, um, is questionable if the whole thing is like, well, there's Orthodox saints that taught the doctrine. It's just not in that article. Um, now, there are several Orthodox saints that have discussed the issue of Immaculate Conception, and they've all rejected it. Canonized saints, like St. Saint John of Maximus, St. Paisos, they reject the Immaculate Conception. This is not, uh, the, for example, there's going to be more coming. Uh, there's Archbishop Dimitri. Um, from Texas, I think, I forget, it's Fort Worth or somewhere, but he has uh, incorruptible, uh, he has an incorruptible body, um, which actually is in like mainstream news sources because like it's an actual incorruptible body. It's not like covered with wax and stuff. Uh, new martyr, Daniel Sezoyev. So we're going to have canonized saints in addition to the ones we already have that deny the Immaculate Conception by name. And so... I find it strange if people say, well, this is like a Protestant thing in, in orthodoxy when like, no, well, these are, this is actually the teaching of our saints on the issue, let alone mm -hmm. decree six of the Council of Jerusalem 1672, by the way. So we have a pan-orthodox council that also weighs in on the issue. Well, but in you, the same you, article, I'm sorry. Yes, you, yeah, as, I was just say, as you laid out earlier, I mean, the sources, the St. Maximus and St. John the Hemocene, exclude the possibility that that uh, that we could embrace the macro conception so this is this is really a, not even a I don't see why this yeah is. it's 
it's if they, if they were to dig up unambiguously, because all these things have to be read in context and people are reading snippets from Ecumenus, so they're not even like people, they're people trying to sell you something. They want Kumbaya, all of us together, which is a good motivation. But again, that's where they're coming from. So I'm giving you a snippet out of context. You can't read the whole context, not translated in English. You know, from the 17th century, if it exists, let's say, I would say we must follow St. Photios and cover the nakedness of our fathers, right? We, we, we don't air out, if they're, if they're outside the consensus, the fathers said something, we don't talk about that stuff. We don't air that out as it gives us license to uh, assert false doctrine. That is not how we deal with the saints, according to St. Fultius. Now, with the same, uh, in the same blog article, and that's in, on Mystagogian Book 5. Uh, in the same article, if uh, someone bothers to read the comments, I have a comment there, actually. And I quote three different 21st century scholars who aren't Protestants, as far as I could tell, rejecting that the saints taught the Immaculate Conception. So this, this is not some sort of apologetics thing. It's not some sort of, oh, look at this quaint saint that's a monk that doesn't know better, right? Like um, Elder George, like you pointed out, he was a professor and everything. But like, you know, these guys are made of, like, they're quaint. They're just in this little corner somewhere in Athos. And they don't know what's going on in the world around them. You know, in fact, they would know more because they, they have God's grace from the ascetic disciplines. But the point is, even people without the grace of ascetic disciplines all recognize the same thing. You know, some sort of uh, kind of blog post, this doesn't quite... It doesn't demonstrate what they need. Now, there's the accusation, like I was alluding to before, that the Immaculate Conception is a Protestant import. And I think that this, I think one could be forgiven because he, uh, Orthodox source was quoted, right? I was very, I'm not surprised because I've seen this years ago. But the point is, I could see someone be surprised that this lure comes from John Pantaleman, I can't pronounce Greek last names, Manosakis. 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 You know, right? So it comes from, uh, he's another ecumenist. And again, we don't want to use these things as slurs. They identify as ecumenists. We're just calling them what they call themselves. They could be very nice people. In fact, I think most ecumenists are nice people. It's the, the road to hell is paved with good direction, uh, uh, with good intentions, right? They they want everyone together. Uh, but the quote, Vladika Luke, yeah, the way we bring unity to churches is to rebaptize everyone and bring them to the Orthodox Church, right? So yeah, we want everyone. We want to be one, as Christ says. May they be. Uh, may you be one, right? So we want that, and so they have good intentions. I'm sure he's a great guy, but the point is he makes a bad argument because by saying that it's a Protestant import, his evidence he cites his father Christian Kops, not an Orthodox scholar, not an Orthodox saint, a Roman Catholic scholar. All right. So how is this a Protestant import where your evidence against it being a, uh, against it being Orthodox is by quoting a Roman Catholic? I it, it's really not a good argument. All right. And so people where Father Christian Kopp's research has profound mythological errors uh, that they're very surprising. Like uh, my favorite, for example, is he speculates that um, if I remember right, that St. Gregory Palamas was reading a translation of, of uh, Thomas Aquinas because of uh, discussions of angels and purification, and not St. Dionysius the Areopagite, who Thomas Aquinas was quoting. So think about that. Think about that argument, that a Greek saint took it from a Roman Catholic author who then took it from a Greek saint. Would it be quicker just to say that the Greek saint was simply reading the Greek saint and he wasn't reading it in Latin translation into Greek, right? It just doesn't make sense. The Occam's razor would say, well, no, we would go by just all sorts of saints read St. Denisius directly, right? It's really, it's just a very bizarre argument. It's all sorts of methodological errors. Uh, another- uh, given, given, what, given that they weren't really that distant in terms of their time, uh, but besides that, what we know that St. Gregory says about uh, the the Latin scholastic theology and its embrace of the Filioque, it's also very questionable why he would be taking that as a source instead of the, the saints of the church. So it sounds very strange. And you know what? I think 
And that'd be true, but and this would also be too. I think it's actually uh, Saint Nicholas Cabasillus. I think I got the wrong saint there. My apologies. Well, he's just a bit further on. But, but and he knew Saint Gregory Palmas. Yeah. So so the point is like Saint Nicholas. Let's let, let's get real. Saint Nicholas Cabasillus was obviously reading Saint Dionysius in the Greek. He didn't need to read Thomas Aquinas to to get this idea about the purification of angels from Saint Dionysius. It's just it doesn't make sense. And so there's these sort of uh, isogetical reaches that are just really not justifiable in COP's research, which um, the latest peer-reviewed research, namely my own, demonstrates that he applies anachronistic anthropology to Byzantine sources, and he's just not a good source. So this renders um, uh, Manosaki's whole objection just moot. You know, he's getting it from the wrong source. He's not getting it. It's just... You know, so you could be forgiven for saying, well, here's an Orthodox person saying it's from Protestantism, but the guy he's getting it from is wrong, is my point. Besides the fact that Manosakis is basically embracing a lot of other things that aren't really consensus in Orthodoxy, like the papal, a papal ecclesiology, and to what I, the little that I've read, it seems like that's what he's, he's on. So it's, from an Orthodox perspective, it's not exactly the best source to try to show that Orthodox are embracing the medical conception. You're not going and, to give and, it and just in general, if his source is a Roman Catholic and not an Orthodox source, and on what basis? Yeah you, yeah, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And so, there was an accusation made that the elders quote um, reveals that the Orthodox believe that human nature is inherently sinful. Uh, now, based upon everything we just discussed, uh, that's why we gave the whole gamut since the apostles on this issue. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But we're going to find that this accusation kind of boomerangs back regrettably, and not on us. Now, Roman Catholics, due to the reasons we just stated with uh, the debate whether the Theotokos died or didn't, they must choose between a Marian prelapsarianist view, that the Theotokos being immaculately conceived allegedly, because again, we're talking about what Roman Catholics must choose between, thereby had, she was like Eve before the fall. And then there is a school I would just call Marian postlapsarianist, that she had the fallen flesh of Adam which we'll get into is kind of bizarre. So what are the problems posed by both these camps? Now, the, the Marian prelapsarianist in Roman Catholicism must affirm, because right there, Mary is from before the fall in every respect in her flesh, must affirm that hunger, grief, and pain, and, and so that means all aspects of sin, precede the fall. Now, that's obviously anathema for us Orthodox. That's not part of human nature. So ironically, this idea that human nature is inherently sinful is actually an allowable opinion within Roman Catholicism. In fact, within that Catholic encyclopedia article, because it said that um, she was immaculately conceived but had sorrow. So being that sorrow is from the fall, you're pretty much saying human nature is inherently sinful. That's how it sounds to us. So boomerangs back there. But here's something more profound. Which, because this is the view which I see, a, not the majority of Roman Catholics have. I think the majority actually are prelapsarianist, but who's doing, who's counting? But the point is, at least in apologetics, this is the majority view, the post-lapsarianist view. Now, if you're a Marian post-lapsarianist, you must affirm a Gnostic dualist anthropology. Now, this is really, really concerning, and it's not my opinion. Now, Bishop Olathorne, Right, who wrote an 1855 book one year after the dogmatization of the Immaculate Conception called The Mother of God. You can read this, pages 58 to 16, pages 90 91. He essentially delineates that the human body can inherit sin, but not the soul. Meaning hmm. Mary inherited sinful flesh, flesh that they could decay, flesh that could have pain, but her soul was sinless. Why? Because the body can inherit sin, but not the soul. Now, this is this idea that a sinful inheritance of Adam could be the body, but the soul is completely sinless, is Gnostic. You could really, you could literally read it in the Gospel of Mary, 8, 10 to 12, verses 8, 10 to 12. It implies the same exact dichotomy. Hmm. That in, in that when Mary's going to the toll houses, and the idea is that her soul is blameless, but they're accusing her for desire because that was in her body. Right. It's, again, Gnostics all over the place. But the point is Gnostics teach, this is more like Gnosticism 101. Gnosticism teaches that the body is bad and the spirit is good and we ought to be liberated from the bodies, which is why Christianity teaches that we'll have glorified human flesh. We'll have eternity in bodies like Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Gnosticism has this dualism that the body's bad, which ironically this post-Lapsarianism 
anthropology endorses that the flesh is sinful and this and the soul is not um this is very 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 disconcerting and it also makes absolutely no sense because in orthodox anthropology sin causes corruption and death this is cause and effect right a soul has a fallen tropos so the body corrupts accordingly cause and effect now yeah. again we just preserve what the fathers teach and they preserve what the apostles taught that deposit of faith the faith delivered once and for all now romans 5 12 says sin entered the world and death through sin seems pretty clear now what is the theological basis for this god upholds life by his divine energies which we must cooperate with right saint maximus talks about this right so we live by cooperating the grace of god that's what our eternity is that's what heaven is it's co-willing and co-energizing cooperating with god forever he wills he operates we will we operate now when we fail to cooperate it's like unplugging from the source of power this cuts us off from his energies which leads to corruption and death of soul and body the soul dies first and the body dies accordingly all right and the saints talk about this and you find and you find this in orthodox uh catechisms um father the name skipping my mind he he was a teacher in jordanville he lived for like a really well, long well, time michael Bolozanski. yes so it's in his catechism this is mainstream stuff well and it's interesting that in the whole discussion that lofton put forward there was no mention of this of this death of the of the soul the second death or the the, or the first death i mean he just talked about the death of the body so there was uh, I think that goes along with what you're saying here, that there's no, there doesn't seem to be an understanding of that. That's why I really wanted to start this discussion at the beginning, Father, because at, it's for all the listeners, they, they could realize, well, wow, this is, the Orthodox doctrine is a, is a pearl of great price. And it yes. can't be, it can't be shortchanged, it can't be compromised. Yes. And that's why the Immaculate Conception just, it can't work, because we have to assume all these things for everything yes. to work. Yes. Now, I also want to point out another scripture that the uh, this Roman Catholic dualist anthropology contradicts, and it's Wisdom 113 and 16. I'm going to just telescope it. The part in the middle doesn't contradict. This makes it unnecessarily long. It states, God did not make death, but the ungodly by their words and deeds summoned death. Mm. Right? So why is this important? The scripture assumes our fallenness causes death. From sin came to the world and then death, right? God did not make death, but then godly call it upon themselves. The Roman Catholic anthropology assumes that God arbitrarily causes all uh, causes death. So you could be sinless, right? You could be a child that never committed a sin, a three-year-old infant. Um, you could be the Theotokos, but you could, because you have Adam's physical flesh, you'll just die arbitrarily, even if your sin was. Uh, as they claim, sinless in every respect, with no even no original sin, right? And so death becomes arbitrary. It's not even connected to the condition of the soul. The hagiographies now make no sense that there's saints that undo death, right? Everything just doesn't make sense anymore. Hmm. And this is where, just so this is why, you know, you talk of papal Protestantism. This is where the faulty Protestant atonement theories like federal headship derive from. Like, because the Protestants don't have the Orthodox tradition, they can't even really explain why we die, why we deal with original sin. It just doesn't make any sense to them. So they just come with these arbitrary theories. Well, Adam was our representative, so God's just going to make you die because he represented you and you had no choice in the matter. doesn't matter what Ezekiel chapter 18 says. Now, obviously, the Orthodox doctrine actually explains how it all works, which is why we know it's well, true. It, and beyond that, isn't it blasphemy to say God is the author of death? Like, Absolutely. The life, He's the author, life of life. the author of life. Life is the author of death. How does that work exactly? It, we're the author of death. That, that's that's the whole point of Wisdom of Solomon chapter one. That's what it's talking about. <laughs> we we made our own death. We're to blame. When we co-energize the devil, we die. And we are born of the tropos, which makes us inclined to co-energize the devil. But we don't have to. We don't have to. Because the Theotokos didn't. Mm. Right? Theotokos didn't at all. Her whole life. And she conquered death. Mm. And there's other saints. There's... Uh, uh, Saint Demetria, Saint Nicholas, there's other there's other Saint saints George, as well, by the way. Saint George voluntarily, right? Um, Saint George basically say, okay, after many, many martyrdoms, I think he said, okay, I guess I'll, I'll I forget I who's the saint that's blind in Russia in the 20th century. I don't have her Matrona. Yes, yeah. 
So, so the point is, like, we have a lot of saints like this. Just like we have incorruptible bodies that are actually incorrupt. So, to me, this fundamentally makes this whole issue we discussed, the prelapsarian, that means unfallen, human nature, substance, usia, whatever word you want to use, um, which is incapable of death, a fundamentally different nature, substance, usia, than the post-lapsarian humanity, which dies as a default despite of sinlessness. Right? So let me repeat that. Yeah. The, no, fact that they, the, yeah. the fact they insert this dichotomy that the, the flesh could be sinful, um, but not the soul, and you could die because even though you're sinless, your flesh is sinful, makes that whole that human essence, because remember, human essence is body and soul, right? It's it's interesting. Human essence is actually made of two different essences, right? Yeah. You know, body and souls are two two different essences. So the human essence that is prelapsarian is incapable of death, but somehow the Pope's lapsarian essence could die as a default. They're actually, mm. you've turned, you've changed their properties. They're now two different essences. Mm. So the, again, the boomerang comes again, whether you're pre-lapsarianist or whether you're post-lapsarianist, they've now made human nature fundamentally different and sinful. And of course, that's heretical, which is why the Orthodox reject either, either of these. Now, my last comments, Father, uh, which I'll just be very brief, is just there were these sort of like these unrelated comments about uh, the papacy, which I didn't see how they really had to do with the quote um, from Father George. That uh, the quote, the Bishop of Rome is a source of unity, end quote. And this is allegedly taught in multiple ecumenical councils. I just want people to be aware, having read every single one of them translating to English, um, that no such quote exists, not in the minutes, not in the canons, not in the decrees. There, there's no such quote. It just doesn't exist. And so you could say, well, I interpret this to be consistent with this, and we could we could have that discussion, but it just that quote, or, or even to me, even conceptually, it just doesn't exist in the councils. There is also the claim made that the formula Hermistas in its various versions, to quote it, all affirm the papal claims. But some people aware this is proven by uh, CA or collect. Collectio Avalana, my Greek pronunciation is bad as my Latin pronunciation. Um, that's Latin there, um, letter 139. And so we know that's not the case. There's sources on this. I just want people to be aware of that. Um, so, like, Father, I think that's everything I was thinking of on this mm -hmm. topic that I think people really had to know. And because if there was a actual appreciation for the Orthodox doctrine, we would not be accused for being impious or for changing things because I think what we're going to see from St. John Maximovich and what St. Uh, Paiso says, all these things are consistent for centuries because it all comes from the apostles. Mm -hmm. So that that's that's my thoughts on the matter. All right, fantastic. Well, that's I, I really appreciate that. I think everybody listening is going to appreciate that because this is what needs to happen if we're going to get serious online about orthodox theology and catechism we've got to always put everything in context we've got to go back to the fathers and there's you know there's this there's this uh, accusation against our work work uh, your work my work i think other people's works that you know we're just picking and choosing of different fathers because that and it suits our presuppositions i think that's exactly what happens that does not happen in orthodox theology cannot happen if you're looking at the Patricia consensus and of course that would be the that would be the the challenge right well okay if you're saying we're picking and choosing what 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 we already are according to our pre, uh, pre, pre uh, presuppositions and our dispositions and our biases well show us show us the, the patristic patrician and show us the consensus uh and which is almost never happens but um it you know hopefully this is going to be an answer that will will help a lot of people who are in the middle i think that there's a lot of people right now uh among the various eastern catholic slash union uh, uh or trad uh roman catholics who are who are going back and forth online between different podcasts and they're trying to figure out you know what is the where is the truth on this where's the patristic consensus and the patristic uh, inheritance and i think you've done a tremendous service tonight to present that uh, and you know he uh, uh, the uh, Michael was asking for a response, and we have given him one. Let's uh, before we close out and uh, go for questions. I don't know. We don't have a moderator tonight, so everybody who's on, or let's say uh, we've got a lot of platforms that we're stri live streaming to right now. We've got Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, 
YouTube, uh, our Orthodox Ethos website, and then Crowdcast. So we can't, unfortunately, take questions from all those all those platforms, but we can on uh, YouTube and Facebook. Uh, if you have posted already a question, the likelihood we're going to get to it is sl slim to none. When we finish in about five to ten minutes after we go through St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco, and you have that question, repost it at the very end of the chat, and then I can start looking at those and going back up and looking at those. So before we go there, though, I want to just go through it really quick. I've taken some excerpts from an article by St. John of Shanghai, and I think it's just going to—it's maybe going to take what you presented and restate it succinctly, and and go ahead and jump in anywhere you want, uh, and we'll talk about it. So I'm going to go. But better, better the saint than me. Yes, of course. And this is another, <laughs> another. We just want to put one more uh, nail in the coffin of this idea that we're not following the saints, or we're not, we're not serious about being disciples of the saints. That's, well, that's what this is all about. We have nothing of ourselves. We're just basically. I always say, you know, to my people listening to me, I say, I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm happy to be uh, Barlam's ass. Basically, that's how I feel. You know, I don't know anything. I don't. I, I just try to repeat what the fathers say. And of course, I could get it wrong, but that's at least, uh, you know, they can take it and they can go look for themselves to the fathers. But the first is this right here. This is the first uh, of, of about 10 uh, snippets from St. John's article. We can just comment on it. First, he says he begins with scriptures and he says, as, as you've done, what we have in scripture is that there is one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, who is the only sinless one. And you can see the scriptural passages there probably pretty, pretty straightforward, but he says we don't actually have that about anyone else, about everyone else, including the mother of God. What we have is that who is pure of defilement, it says in Job. No one who has lived a single day of this life on earth can say that they do not have, they do not have some uh, share in the fallen condition. I'm going to, and I'll just interject that, you know, there's some of these words translation like defilement um, sounds impious, uh, the same word, for example, is used by St. Cyril of Jerusalem in the English translation that is, of course, in one of his catechetical lectures. And so this is something that our saints, even mutual saints, um, do use. And we're not saying defilement again in the sense that the Theotokos was conceiving of sin or committing sins yes. or any or any such impious thing. The defilement is simply the fallen tropos. And again, God's eyes are, are too pure than to look upon sin. Um, I'm trying to remember Habakkuk in chapter one says that. And so that's why, let's say, the Ark of the Covenant, when they picked it up, they had to hold the they had to hold it with poles and it was covered and it could never be touched by someone. That's why Uzo was struck dead. Because the Ark Covenant had to be undefiled, couldn't be touched by sinful man. Right. And so this is so the sense of defilement the whole we're moralistic, talking about. The whole moralistic, we're we're bathed in a moralism in the West, in English, and I mean, among many contemporaries. So they're immediately thinking moralistically about the term, but actually it's not at all in that context. I, I think it's a good point. That you're yes. Mm -hmm. He goes on, he says, God, uh, quoting Romans uh, 5, 8 to 10, God commended his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If we, if we, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of the son, etc. So just showing again, scripturally, what the witness is concerning uh, uh, the common humanity. Now he says, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception contradicts psychic like, tradition as well, not just the scriptures. The fathers referred to her exalted sanctity from her birth, as well as her cleansing by the Holy Spirit at her conception of Christ, but not at a conception of Christ, not at her own conception by uh, her mother, St. Anne. That's the uh, patristic, you know, Consensus. And and just so people are aware, because I think people are kind of try to what say what say uh John is talking about particularly is what we were talking about at the full dose of theosis at the Annunciation. Um we believe that there was a grace preceding her conception. Saint Joey Kimanana did pretty much the impossible yeah, and had a dis and dispassionately conceived the Theotokos. So of course there is grace preceding her conception and, and grace throughout her life. Yes. But but this but that is not what St. John is talking about there. He's focusing on the Annunciation. Yes. And, and the not, particular kind of grace there. Well, yeah, the, and, the, and the, the implications are not in terms of ancestral sin and the condition of common condition of man. So she was not placed in the state of being unable to sin, 
This is very important. But continue to take care of her salvation, overcome all temptations. He's quoting a few patristic sources, how they referred to her. So they do not ima they do not imagine that she's unable to sin, which is the implication. Is it not of the Immaculate Conception that that was not possible? Yeah, and and I want to address that, and I might I'm going to try to get to a quote from Saint Nicholas Capucin. So I'm saying this is here's what we don't mean. That, of course, well, Eve didn't have original sin. This is a common yarn. Well, Eve didn't have original sin, but she sinned. So she was able to sin. And that's not where, what we're St. John is talking about here. What, what he's talking about is, again, that to be in the state where you'd have to be deceived, like it wouldn't be part of your condition where sinning is something that's within your capacity because of a fallen tropos. Again, that's why we began this, talking about the whole issue of tropos. You really need to um, understand it. Now, like to, to quote um, St. Nicholas Cabasillus in his Nativity Narrative, he says oh, wait, that... Let me just, let me just say St. Nicholas Cabasillus is the, how he said it anyway. Sorry about that. <laughs> but, and he is a towering figure in late Roman slash Byzantine Orthodox theology, which really summarizes much in both the, way, the life in Christ and in divine liturgy. So he's a, real, he's a really great authority uh, who, like St. John of Damascus, is really summarizing and following the fathers before him and... And, and Father, always interrupt and correct, correct my pronunciation, please. No worries. Yeah. And so the saint uh, says that um, she came from the earth, from the fallen human race that had given her her own nature. Again, that word nature that he's talking about. So again, he flat out says she comes from the fallen human race. But yet despite all this, to quote him, overcame all evils from the beginning to the ends, thereby uncovering the true human nature as it was originally created, and as a result, escaped the common disease, being just human and without receiving anything more than other men. All right, so that, that's quoting Saint Nicholas. So, as you could see, she was not placed, like Saint John says, in the state of being unable to sin, but continued to take care of her salvation, right? So, like in the word words of Saint Nicholas, um, that she over, she escaped the common disease, right? She overcame all evils. So all St. John is saying is what's, what earlier saints had said. Mm -hmm. And that's usually how you know the saints. They always speak like the other saints speak. Yes. Continuing, the mad conception is meaningless because if the pure Christ could be born only of the Virgin, uh, if the Virgin might be born pure, it would be necessary that her parents also should be pure of original sin and their parents right up to Adam inclusive. But then there would not have been any need for the very incarnation of Christ since Christ came down to earth in order to annihilate sin. So that's not what, something we did not touch on. You want to comment on that? Yeah, I would just say because St. John is, um, he's replying to a transducinianist understanding of original sin, of inherited guilt. That's kind of waned in popularity in recent years in Roman Catholicism. I actually, from what I could tell, their catechism even teaches against it. So I would I would go as far as say it's not their official doctrine. But that being said, that is what he's responding to, and he's making a, an identical argument that Thomas Aquinas made. So, so it's just people aware, it's not that St. John's being an ignoramus. He's addressing multiple objections. And so he's giving the well, answer it, to whatever. It's not Saint, it's not St. John's fault that they've changed. <laughs> and they're changing, or or, or the or you're gonna or you're playing rope a dope and you're getting different ones from all different angles, you know. Right, so, right, right. Okay. The mad conception makes God unmerciful and unjust because if God could preserve Mary from sin and purify her before her birth, why doesn't He not purify other men before their birth rather than leave them in sin? Any thoughts it's, on uh, that? I'm sorry, Father. Go ahead. I was gonna say, any thoughts on that? From your from your research I, I i would just say it's just more of a general point that why would why would he do this one exceptional thing for one person and not anyone else including these other sinless saints like saint demetrius and other people we knew that didn't sin right so it's just it, it just wouldn't be uh fair and i think the connection which they haven't seen yet which i'm sure you'll quote is because there is victory in overcoming sin, right. right? It's like almost a grace. It's a kind of grace that God permitted the Theotokos and St. Demetrius and these other saints, uh, Jeremiah the prophet and other saints to uh, to go through these things. 
And so that's in the very legalistic way the West sees it. It's just, it's all about advantage. And like, oh, you know, it's just, you know, not fair. And he's saying, well, and I think being somewhat condescending those sensibilities, it just wouldn't be unfair according to um, that mindset. So it also points it. back to the question of, is she the great exception or the great, uh, great example? Is she the first of many or is she just one that, that, that never can be repeated? Mm -hmm. And the Orthodox, so that, I think that also points to this. Why, why would this be the case? And the Lord, uh, you know, is coming to save all of humanity. And then he does special for her. What does that really follow? Is that really consistent with what we understand the Lord doing? So it follows likewise that God saves men apart from their will, predetermining certain ones before their birth, birth to salvation. So it does. Do you think that the whole idea of predestination played a role at all in their? Were they affected by the that that kind of legalistic distortion of Paul and? Augustine? My 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 personal opinion actually is that the Immaculate Conception is a hodgepodge of varying of varying wrong doctrines and, and misnomers, and so once something becomes kind of a tradition. And you don't know where it came from because it's aberrant. And, and not to be crass, I don't mean this to be mean, but all false doctrines come from the devil. Because like I said before, there's not a single bad idea that ever occurred to your mind that was your own idea. It always starts with the devil. So if, keywords if, because the idea is not to be uncharitable. If the Immaculate Conception is a false doctrine, then it, it comes from the devil. <laughs> and so men, in their nature are good. They're going to try to, if they were deceived by this false doctor and they're going to try to come up with different reasons and rationales. And so I do think predestination was part of it. I do think the belief in ancestral sin was part of it. And I think there's a certain point where it just became ad hoc. It's just like, it's just what so many people believed in the West. They had to just come up with some way for it to work, such as uh, the, the scholastic differentiations between body and soul and one could have sin, one can't. I mean, of course, no, it's ridiculous. No one's thinking of that normally. That That's something you come up ad hoc because you have to, because you've already accepted something aberrant. So now you have to try to make what's aberrant sound like it's not aberrant anymore. Mm. So that's so why, my view. Why didn't they, why didn't they, it uh, wasn't Cle Bernard of Clairvaux and, and and Aquinas, weren't they against the, the doctrine? of a um, I know Aquinas was definitely, I, I don't know so, as much about Bernard of Clairvaux. I think you're right though. Uh, but I would I would just say from what I could tell, I can't say I've really studied them particularly, but from what I could tell, their objections are consistent within the worldview, their, the aberrant scholastic worldview that Thomas Aquinas had, for example. And so it shows that there's inconsistencies within their own tradition and that these internal inconsistencies, but generally speaking, they don't have much import to us because they're already so far divorced from the orthodox yeah. anthropological. I'm curious why they didn't listen to him in the West. Why did they reject somebody like Aquinas after 700, 600 years, whatever it was? They turned away and said, no, we're not going to listen to him on this topic. It's kind of interesting. When I was in the Vatican, there's, I think it was on the ceiling, but there's a, a beautiful mural, such gorgeous art there, where it was about the... Uh, the definition of the Immaculate Conception, its dogmatization, and like essentially they're handing something to the Theotokos, and she has this pose like, oh my, you shouldn't have, you know? And then you see like Thomas Aquinas in the corner, kind of begrudgingly doing this because he was wrong. It's so, <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty funny painting. It's kind of the connection between what we're talking about. People should all right, what <laughs> going on, this teaching completely denies all her virtues. If she, even yes. in the womb, even in the womb, when not even able to do to desire anything good or evil, was preserved by God's grace from every impurity, and then by that grace was preserved from sin even after her birth. Then what does her merit in what does her merit consist? If she, without effort or without having impulse to sin, remained pure, then why is she crowned more than everyone else? Yeah. The, the Immaculate Conception denies her victory over temptations. From a victor who has worked from a victor who is worthy to be crowned with glory, this makes her a blind instrument of providence. I think that's one of the most strongest points that St. John makes. In what, what else to be add to be added to that? It's, it's just, it's a blasphemy against the Theotokos, right? Like, right. Her whole voluntary death hinges upon her attainment of spiritual perfection, which was all, it was all hundred percent God's grace and hundred percent her cooperation with that grace. Mm. Why take that away from her? So the whole doctrine of synergy can't, doesn't exist here. No, I don't see how it can. 
which is at the heart of patristic soteriology. I mean, this is this this is why this this is topic. I mean, there's some Orthodox who say, eh, it's not a big it's huge. It goes yeah. to so many it it, it 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 highlights so many divergences from patristic soteriology, theosis, synergy, all these things that are key to the spiritual life. Yeah. And and again, and I'll just say it just puts so many saints into disrepute. Right, which the Catholic Encyclopedia article on the Immaculate Conception even says that there were some that were even in error, right? Like we have to say saints are wrong because there are so many saints that, and it's the consensus of saints that are utterly inconsistent with this false Roman Catholic doctrine. Shall we read the last two paragraphs of St. John and then open up to questions or is this, is this sufficient from St. John? Because we have two more paragraphs. I mean, that's up to you, Father. I'm game. Uh, I do think it can only go downhill from there, though, because those those are such important words. Okay. Well, I'll just encourage everybody to go and, and read that then. I'm not going to share, although he goes on and, and says much more. But you're going to want to just look look up. Let's see. Let me get the title of, the, of what it's posted as an Orthodox Christian Understanding of the Immaculate Conception, St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco. You can find it at Pravoslavia, Orthodox Christian, and I think some other places. So if you're still wanting to go further and see a contemporary saint, an Orthodox saint, what they're saying about this uh, uh, doctrine, then I think you you can uh, you can do that with St. John and have a pretty definitive answer, or at least a good uh, general answer. All right, so let's see if I, I'm, I'm going to have a tough time trying to find uh, the questions. We don't have a moderator tonight, which usually helps me and collects all the questions, but uh, let me first of all, let me get rid of that. I think I scared uh, him away, Father. Yeah, maybe they're... They, they, they maybe, heard I was the guest. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe that was too much for them. But let's see. Anybody have any questions they want to repost? I'm looking at the questions here, uh, at least in um, we're in YouTube and I think Facebook. If you have questions, put a big in all all caps question and uh, and flag it in that way. And we'll 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 ask uh, we'll entertain your questions. But I don't see any. I'm scrolling up here. I mean, I could read them, but then you can post them on screen. Like you see some questions? Do you see? Some yeah, questions? like like uh, eight fifty, like at eight fifty three p.m. Eight sh says something. You want me just to read it because I have no way of making it big or anything. Uh, I can put it. Oh, here it is. Okay, is this it? I think so. Yep, that's it. Why would God depriving us of the joy of freely choosing Him be seen as a blessing? Why would God depriving us? So he's saying, like, why would God permit the Theotokos or any ascetic to encounter difficulty. Why is that a blessing? Wouldn't this be a subtle way of implying that God isn't actually more desirable a choice than the alternative? I'm, the second question, I mean, what do you think, Father? It's, I read all the time, like in the Desert Fathers and stuff, like the idea, like there's certain Desert Fathers that purposely try to encounter sin so they could overcome it. Right. It's I. by the way, I don't recommend that for anyone in the audience. We're talking about, you know, super holy men, saints doing some of this stuff. But the idea is that we are saved through difficulties. The difficulties God permits to us. God doesn't cause difficulties. He permits difficulties in trials and tribulations. So that way, when we um, cooperate and co-will with him, it's that much stronger. Right. It's it's. What is the more praiseworthy thing? To do what is easier, to do what's hard. God wants to give you the crown for doing what's hard. Mm. Yeah, the first question I'm still trying to understand, I don't really see, when, when God is depriving us of the joy of freely choosing him, when, what is that? I, I think he's that? saying, like, why have original sin and make it hard, you know, and all that stuff. I think that's where it's coming from. But Well, it's not God depriving us of the joy. No, but, but God could deprive us of grace for a time, for example. I'm maybe being too charitable with this question. Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what, what's, 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 the, 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 there's. You know, the Lord has all kinds of pedagogy for us, but it's always in the context of making us more perfect, bringing us closer to Him. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't think I would ever describe it as God. I mean, God is like intentionally doing. That's like God does evil or God does something intentionally bad. I don't think that's if that's what they're implying. That's certainly not the case. But um, so it's hard to. God depriving us of the joy of freely choosing him to be seen as a blessing. I don't think that happened. So I'm not really, the, the question seems to be problematic to me, unless I'm just misunderstanding it. And then it goes on. 
Wouldn't this be a subtle way of implying that God isn't actually more desirable a choice than love? Well, I don't think the first statement makes sense. Let's see if there's a follow-up. That SH, if they want to follow up and try to explain to me more. Uh, let's see. We got some questions now. In uh, light of Tabor, let's put that on there. Question was: Was there a specific point in time when the sign of the cross was changed from right to left to left to right by the Latins? <laughs> That's interesting. Not really super important, but um, I don't know. You're the historian more than I am. Do you have any oh. historical data on that? Well, we do know it happened during the, like the Middle Ages because we we there's actually like it's I don't know if it's going to make the final cut of the book um, Errors of the Latins, but it does actually. There's a pope that talks about it, and he talks about doing the sign of the cross the right way. So it's amongst mm -hmm. the several several things like leaven uh, unleavened bread and and what, whatnot what, what that have creeped what, in. What, what century? What century? Do you I, if I remember right, it's something like eleventh. It's like it's always at, it's like a century or two after the schism. It's like literally after the schism that grace is cut off, and you just start seeing. Well, I know isn't that amazing. When I did you ever see that that little podcast? I did, but I mean, more importantly, did you ever read? Uh, Eve Congar after 900 years. Um, it's worthwhile to read that. Any any serious Roman Catholic inquirer needs to read Eve Congar after 900 years. I mean, he says right there very clearly that everything changes in the 11th, 12th centuries in the West. And they, and a Christian of the 9th century would not understand, would not be at home in a uh, post schism uh, 11th, 12th century, uh, you know, Western Church. Um, it would just be a huge mass of changes and he, and he confirms it all, which to me is just damning because that's the fruit of apostasy or, or of schism at least, right? And falling away from the the grace of God. But so if that's the case, if this is just one more innovation, that would be one more thing. I, I just never have even paid attention to when that might have happened. But interesting. Um, let's see another question here. Uh, you may have addressed this. What is the Eastern Orthodox understanding of full of grace in Luke 12, 128? How is this verse understood? in orthodox father you, you did address it i think right it's the incarnation how much more yes. full of grace could he get <laughs> yes yes i did uh let's see i'm trying to go i'm going up and trying to find the questions because i don't want to miss any and we'll come back down as is quite a few questions here uh all right I think the best way to answer the topic of Immaculate Conception is to answer this question firstly was Mary repenting daily and if so why since she had no personal sins. All right, so maybe we need to, we need to unpack what repentance means. Well, it's life is given to us for repentance, as uh, St. Isaac the Syrian says. And so repenting is simply aligning our will with God. So you, you don't have to repent because he did something wrong. You're repenting as a way of life. Yes, so I, exactly. I, repentance I'm, is return. It is return to God. So it, everyone is on the path of return. And not in the sense that we have a chasm, but God, that, that return is eternal. It's there's never it's a never ending return. It's, it's always going deeper. Uh, so in God, there's no there's, it's not finite, right? So uh, it, it's a like you said, it's a stance, a way of life. And of course, the Mother of God would be in that stance, more, par excellence, from from any other human being. She would be in, in that in that stance. So it's a it's a different understanding of repentance, I think, than we, if it's not legalistic, moralistic idea. It's a it's a question of orientation. Yeah. The word in Greek, repentance, metania, is not referring to the dianya, the the rational intellect, but to the nous, to the spirit of man, and it's and it really is about a reorientation. Uh, and so uh, the mother of God was always oriented, right, toward God. Uh, and so she was always uh, directed toward God. Uh, but that, I would say that that is not a static reality. You know, it's an, a dynamic, ever-growing reality. Maybe that's one way to put it. What do you think? Yep. No, I think I think that says it. Okay. Another question. Um, did we already answer this? It's well, no, it's the same person, I think. The same person, okay. How does Christ experience experience? I think he wants to say blameless passions, like his mother does not make. Okay, how does Christ experience him blameless passions, like his mother does not make him subject to original sin, like his mother? How come when willing he manifests blameless passions, thirst, hunger? Okay, I think you well, answered. He's God. That, but... He can work miracles. He 
he voluntarily, according to St. John the Damascene, I think it's chapter 23, where it's literally stated, uh, book three of exposition, Orthodox faith. He voluntarily, both his divine and human wills, because there's two wills in the one person of Christ, um, voluntarily uh, assumed these things. And so the human will accepted the fact that this was going to occur, and the divine will, because God could work miracles, permitted it to take place. So that is, uh, I mean, why, I, I don't otherwise understand the question. It's, it's voluntary. How could God do voluntarily impossible things? Because he's God. Hmm. How does Christ experiencing blameless passions like his mother does not make him subject to original sin? Because, but, well, for Theotokos, it was involuntary. Involuntary, as St. Maximus was saying, right? Mm -hmm. Christ did so willingly. She did so because she had to. Yeah. That's that's the difference. Okay. Another question. Wouldn't the Immaculate Conception also change Mary and Jesus' lineage? I don't think so. How, how right? How would that work? <laughs> no, that, that, yeah, I don't think that's uh, Is this a question? In the end, is, if Mariology is incorrect, Christology then will begin incorrect. If Jesus is Christ is the truth and figuring out who Christ actually uh, actually it, it, exactly is i guess he's so, saying like he's just saying there's a, a one for one thing we have to have we have to have correct mariology otherwise our christology and anthropology and soteriology are going to be messed up and i think that's what we demonstrated during yeah. this episode yeah. you may have addressed this oh we already did that okay um david g lineage in that way mm, don't know what he's talking about okay. he's trying to help him the question. Okay. <laughs> question was there a specific point in time when the sign of the cross we already did that i'm sorry i, I i'm not doing... how can craig say that christ didn't sorrow when christ said in the garden that his soul was sorrowful unto death see he's trying to throw all the tough ones at me i, I would recommend <laughs> he reads the the minutes of lateran 649 this is something that saint maximus the people there they take a lot they take a lot of time the fathers and saints and also the fourth and fifth century saints do as well in dealing with the issue in the garden and what exactly it means and what it comes down to well how do we say this simply let me say this one you're not going to find a father say christ felt bad for himself right you didn't have that sort of sorrow or grief but two did he have physical pains and did he have a natural Open. form of aversion i'm sorry you answered this earlier empathy you said well he had empathy like when he wept now i don't think the fathers when they talk about uh the garden of gethsemane they're not talking about empathy when it speaks of his sorrow there what they okay. are speaking about and all right i'm going to recommend read salvation through temptation by dr benjamin heidgerk and if you want this unpacked i'm going to give the very condensed version man according to nature has desires and appetites for example man according to nature wants to live look think of in the garden of eden where um, God warns them, if you eat from the, the, the fruit of this tree, you will die. And when Satan deceives Eve, he says, surely you will not die. So obviously Eve had a desire to live. Desire is good. We have desires for good things. Wanting to live is a good thing. And so Christ, according to his sinless nature, had this desire to live, right? That, that's, that's not even a blameless passion. That's encoded into nature. Uh, Honestly, it's, I mean, scientifically speaking, Father, you look at a paramecium under a microscope, they're not even sentient, like they don't think, but yet they want to live. It's encoded in all of life because mm -hmm. living is good. <laughs> it comes yeah. from God, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a naturally, an actual na nature. It's in the intact, unfallen tropos uh, desire. Now, that being said, in the garden, Christ was posed with the natural good desire to live and the necessity to undergo death voluntarily for our salvation. Mm. So he's having these conflicting desires, the desire to do God's will and the desire to live, which is also part of human nature. And that's why Christ says, let your will, not my will be done. He's not saying that him and the father have two different wills. That's actually theologically impossible. The divine essence has only a single will. All right. A single divine will. So, and if we, um if we accept as the fathers do that sinless human nature always reflexively tries to do, do the will will of god christ had a will not to do natural human will which is to live mm -hmm. and so of course that creates a sort of sorrow which is what it's uh 
I think the Greek word is encompassing sorrow pretty much. Mm -hmm. But that's the sorrow that's being spoken of. It's, it's Christ not doing a good to do a greater good, to mm -hmm. willingly, voluntarily um, undergo the passion for us. And so it's a very profound question that doesn't do it enough justice. If is people want where, to dive in, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, Father. Is that where Metropolitan Anthony Kerbovitsky gets his idea of the do dogma of redemption in the Garden of Gethsemane? Because it's a kind of cru crucifixion right there that he's living. The Lord well, is, already, have, is already living the crucifixion ahead of time in a way, spiritually, right? It's, it's well, it's again, Christ assumed our pain to undo pain because he didn't have to have pain, right? He's sinless. So it's almost like a big illegal operation on your computer. Christ assumed everything he did not have to assume that was sinless. So that way we could have no sin because we involuntarily have all these things and cooperate with the devil, yes. right? We're children of wrath. Christ not being a child of wrath uh, accepts the sinless effects of the fall to undo the fall for us. So it's incarnational. It's It has to do with his actual pains. It has to do with his actual death. It has to do with his resurrection. They're all connected. Mm. Very good. What is a sinful man in contrast to a sinless man? What is sinfulness? This is um, a Romanian. I, the, the Romanians have the, all these, you know, you published in a Romanian journal. Yeah. Romanian, <laughs> I'm pretty, pretty sure Alexander here is a Romanian. Let, Romanians let me, have let me, these. Let me, let me say a joke the Romanians expense. It's because they're screwed up that they publish me. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, what is a sin, sinful man in contrast to a sinless man? Again, sin is just consenting not to do the will of God. Yeah. Right. So uh, that that I think that'd be the main difference. It's a, it's a is does the does the English help here? The it's a missing of the mark. The mark is communion, and therefore a sinful man is one who lives in a way that precludes or excludes communion. We also speak of sin. In a slightly different sense. So the Theotokos is that sin. And she's all holy. But the liturgy also says there is only one who's without sin, the Lord Jesus Christ. Which yes. I'm paraphrasing because I don't say the liturgy every Sunday, right? <laughs> I don't say it any Sunday. So that being said, um, there's sin as an original sin. And there's um, sin as in consenting to sin. So like yeah. we'd have to actually categorize what we're talking about. Here. Yeah, the condition and then the desire or the decision. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. Can you explain precisely how our orthodox orthodoxy maybe differs from the Pelagian heresy? Augustine's opponent. And do orthodox sometimes exaggerate our differences with Protestants in, in a way? In a very, I could say it very succinctly. Pelagianism lacks the idea that the tropos has fallen. Because Pelagianism teaches mm. that human nature um, and its tropos is completely intact. And so then you don't require grace to overcome the fallen tropos because your nature is intact. Mm. It doesn't, it's not fallen. So th there's actually couldn't get more different than orthodoxy and Pelagianism. I would say Western anthropology, um, like Calvinism, is also different than Pelagianism, but for a different way because it's divorced from, you know, the patristic anthropology. Hey, Greg, thanks for all your work. If the Immaculate Conception nullifies synergy, then what would you say of Adam who didn't have fallen impulses? Was he not synergistic with God? Oh, no, of course, both Adam and Eve were synergizing with God, yeah, you know, and that's why Satan had to deceive them and say there was a different way to be like God. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Oh, you could be like God by not synergizing like that. That's literally what how the fall started. Yes. Yeah, you could be like God, but don't do what God says. That's it's, what that's what created the whole problem. <laughs> to be God without God, you know. Yeah. To become it's, God without God. I think so. the Damascene calls it false divinization. That's what the promise in the garden was, was that's false. The perennial, that's the perennial temptation. And that's the you. That's why we're, in the end times, like we're in the utopia. It's all about creating a false kingdom of false savior all it's not the devil is always trying to say well yeah we'll give you i'll give you what he promises and what you want but i'll give it to you in a cheap easy way without a cross without a crucifixion yeah right um a life without struggles to do god's will god has better things in store for us you may have addressed this. What is each Orthodox understanding? Oh, we already did that. Yeah, we did. I keep I asking the same question. Are, he's they're he's reposting. Like, no, they're reposting because they think I didn't see it. Maybe did I hear you reject the doctrine of ancestral sin? 
No, as, no, as no, you no. said in the beginning, the original sin and ancestral sin are both technically canonical vocabulary. It just depends what translation of the patristic documents. Well, I think he's trying with. to say that don't we have a different vision of it from the Augustinian vision in the in the East? Isn't there? There's differences in that. Maybe that's what he's trying to say. I don't know. I mean, perhaps I'd say it's again like I I personally am more charitable on that issue because from what i could tell in the roman catholic catechism they don't teach inherited guilt and so at least they got something official that says this is officially what we don't believe so i see that as a good thing yeah we'll probably won't get into that tonight i mean we could do another one on uh take uh ancestral sin by father john romanides have you have you have you i've never read on? i've never read that book and so i People have accused me of being against him. People have accused me of being for him. And I say, that's why I won't read his book. So that way people will take my synthesis, the father's on its own merits. <laughs> I think it's a phenomenal book, but it would be, it would be an interesting discussion. I, sure. I, I think because, it would be father. Yes. Because he's very well versed in the early church fathers. On the, on the, I mean, that's the whole thing is focused on the early centuries. Um, what do we got? Question. When Elizabeth states, mother of my Lord in the scripture, does she utilize the Kini word Kyrios? Any additional context to the specific word uh, used that we you can speak? Yes, Kyrios, yeah, for sure. Kyriosmu, Kyrios, uh, Theosmu, and like, it's the same thing what St. Thomas says. I'm not sure what 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 else would there be. Kyrios is Lord. Uh, hey, Craig, thanks for all your work. If the... Was that was that the same? Oh, one? they're re they're re maybe they're reposting. They're trying it. to help you. They're trying to help you, Father. Yeah, See, that's a meek problem finding questions. Isn't he thou indeed a great demonstration of meekness? Okay, that's not a question. Sorry, I'm trying to get the questions. Okay, we did that. What do you do when you feel unwelcome to attend services in a, the closest Orthodox church? Go anyway or try another one. Um. Well, you grew up in the church, Father. Do you, have, do, you, do you have any, have you ever ran into that? That's nice that you said that, but actually I'm a convert as well. But I mean, weren't you pretty young though? Like your dad's yeah, I was 21 when I became more. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Yeah. 30 years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, uh, there's a couple different ways. I don't know. I mean, that's a pastoral question. We, we could see what, what, what's possible in your area. Why are they not welcoming you? There's a lot of things I would want to ask you if you were like sitting in front of me, but um, I would not allow anyone to struck my way to communion with Christ. So I would uh, do whatever I had to do to either attend that parish or find another one. And uh, I'm not there because of before or in spite of anyone. I'm there for Christ. So we have to make, uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't matter ultimately if people around us are doing good or bad. Uh, we're there because we're we're there for Christ and to commune with Christ. So I would say go uh if you can find another parish nearby and they're more welcoming i guess that's that's not you know nobody's going to tell you don't go there but yeah that, that's what my spiritual father said he said that uh essentially you go what's best for your family what what brings you closer to god right it's a i think people in the internet think oh it has to be this jurisdiction it has to be that jurisdiction you have to go where the priest and the parish are strongest and most faithful and um you to make but you know it's keep an open mind because also like you think they're not being welcoming but they could be linguistic things it could be because they you know there's certain decorum in an orthodox church and you you were dressed wrong or, or whatever yeah it's probably and, probably, probably and so you know but it doesn't mean people aren't jerks too there's jerks out there too so it's you know there's a lot of different things that go into this okay we got probably have it looks like people are asking a, a bunch of questions so i'm not sure if we're going to be able to get oh yeah there's tons of questions so i don't think we're going to get to all of them uh but let's let's do another five or so maybe we're already sure. at two hours and two hours and 18 minutes does the bible have any references to holy water i was confronted by a protestant about this he told me that it's a pagan practice introduced during the time of constantine um so i'm gonna let, i'm gonna let you answer the next couple ones so i can i can field all the questions the, the, the be honest, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to research it. Uh, I do know that it comes up in fourth century fathers. Um, obviously, we don't have a single document saying Constantine invented holy water. Whether it's post Nicene in its first recorded um, discussion, I don't know. But because there's purification rites and stuff for, uh, for things where they baptize in water in Judaism, it doesn't really seem like it would be 
and they bless things in Judaism, they bless things with oil. Um, at the very least, we would say if there wasn't holy water explicitly in the scripture, because I really don't remember, we definitely have types for it anyway. Um, so, but yeah, I would have to look more. It goes it. back to the Feast of Theophany. It's an ancient, it's an ancient, uh, uh, that's where it starts. The blessing of the waters on the Feast of Theophany. And then it becomes something that's done, the lesser blessing. And it's done that it's done every month in the in the monasteries. Um, but I don't know. I don't know the answer to the historical. I mean, the, the whole the whole fixation of Protestants on Constantine and the historical change is just it's it's really unfortunate because it implies that the church is not what Christ promised it would be, and that is that it will it'll exist until the end. I'll be with you in all and all throughout the ages. I'll guide you in all truth. Uh, and you're and the, anybody who believes the church just disappeared at some point in history or just you know went underground and nobody could see it for a thousand years it's just delusional it's like that, that's not even you cannot support that scripturally or patristically or anything so well, so that father that, I, I I got bad news I did find out it was invented by Constantine in the book of numbers numbers 517. And shall the priest take holy water in an earthen vessel? So, <laughs> so it's a, it, apparently it is in the Bible. <laughs> it was not. In, it was invented by the Numbers, the Book of the Numbers. Is that what you said? It's in Numbers five seventeen. Oh, okay. So I'm joking that Constantine yeah. went back in time and. Oh, I see. I see. <laughs> okay, um, I'm just gonna have to pick some random questions because there's, there's a whole bunch. Um, uh, we, somebody said, why isn't Father Peter answered? Well, Craig is my guest, and he's actually very well-versed in all kinds of historical matters that I'm not as well-versed in, so I'm very happy. Uh, let's see if this is a question. Why was why was assuming the blameless passion necessary for our salvation? That's a good question. Because Christ had to, undo, had to undo the fall, right? The blameless passions are the effects of the blame, blameworthy passions. So, like, right, the fact that we do sinful things it's why we corrupt and die and feel pain it's why all these things are in this world so christ said you know what i'm going to take the penalty the effect of the bad things you did having done nothing to deserve it having nothing no, nothing to cause it i'm going to voluntarily take this on because right that undoes the whole cause and effect of why there are blameless passions so it's a it's a pretty much a resetting of the law of nature which is a, a patristic term they call that law of nature isn't the issue with the conception, if it was true, then Mary wouldn't have a need of a savior? So Jesus wouldn't have human nature as well then? Okay. Can we uh, kind of answer that, but you can give us... I, I, I just say, I know what Roman Catholics will say, well, Christ's merits were applied before her birth, so he's a savior in this like retroactive way. Um, and there is some sense it's true, because all grace is from, you know, from, from God, right? But the main thing is... There, well, I also want to add this. There's more to salvation than just not having sin, right? Like you have to persevere in faith. You have to cooperate with God's grace. You know, uh, a sinless infant without the grace of baptism is not saved. So we need to cooperate with the grace of God. We need to encounter the grace of God. These are things necessary for our salvation. And so, when you say they're not saved. I mean, we have to unpack. Salvation is synergy. It's communion. It's it, And it presupposes a free... Uh, uh, disposition, a good disposition, a willingness on the part of the person to cooperate. So it, 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 it's impossible to talk about. I mean, a lot of times people just don't unpack the words, and that's why they have a, a lot of confusion in my experience. I don't know. Well, that's, I think that's why it's well worth the time that we started the way we did, yeah. unpacking some of those words. <laughs> uh, how does the issue of concupiscence relate to the Mary and this discussion? Does EO teach that concupiscence is sin? I'd say short answer, it's sinful. Everyone with a fallen tropos will have that. But it's not like you don't go to hell because you have blameworthy passions. You go to hell if you don't repent from blameworthy passions. Because I think that's what people focus on. They think like, I've seen Protestants say this. Oh, you know, Mary had sin because you know, she was able to think this thing that was wrong or able to think that they'll find some of those things from St. Basil and whatnot. And our point is, no, it's not sin to reject something sinful, right? It's like, that's the thing. She, was, she had the capacity to deal with the blameworthy passions. They were part of her existence, but she she never 
conceived or consented or anything to them. So, um, so that's something people should keep in mind. So is concupiscence essentially lust or is it something, uh, you know, well, it's lust know the it's... flesh, right? So like, but so it would be, although it would just be the blameworthy passions, I think is I, it's the, I think the easiest way to include it in our understanding of, of man's dilemma, but we would add the blameless passions. I never hear that in the, um, Western paradigm. So Ben saying we missed the point. His point was that if fallen impulses are required for synergy, then Adam didn't synergize. Why would fallen impulses be required for synergy? I guess they're not they're required for synergy. You could synergize without them, but yeah. in a sense, they're like a performance enhancer. It's like the Kenyan runners running in the the high altitudes, right? They could run at you know they could run at the bottom of mountain, but they want to be able to run and endure um with less oxygen so when they're running the marathon they could run faster I, I i don't know maybe that's too obscure of a reference i've ran a couple of marathons in my day but so so the point is that god permits us to encounter difficulties because one the reward is greater right like i said to overcome a difficulty um it deserves greater reward than overcoming something that's not difficult but two you get stronger Right. Like, I mean, let's just quote the Bible it says in James, you know, consider, you know, consider all joy when you're into trials and tribulation because it builds perseverance or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. So the point is, it's a performance enhancer. Do Orthodox apologists go too far in differentiating our theology in regards to a lack of original sin? I, I think they do. Um, and I think it's not I think it's more in the English language discourse that. We, we act as if we don't have any sort of doctrine of this. And I think what we have to be careful say is we have a doctrine of ancestral sin. We have a doctrine of original sin, but here's what we mean by it. And I think that's the right way to go at it. You read, you read Romanides and we'll have another talk. It'll be very interesting. <laughs> how, how about we go, you, you present Romanides and I present uh, the fathers I've read and then we could compare it, and contrast. It's going to be the same. It's going to be the same. <laughs> All right. Uh, considering the definition, let's see. Uh, considering the definition of repentance as a way of life, did Adam repent prior to his sin? I didn't think we. I don't think we defined it as a way of life, did we? But okay. Well, it's it's definitely it's well I mean, not only life has been given to us for repentance. I quoted Saint Isaac the Syrian. Yeah. Yes. And well, that's what we do because of our fallen tropos before the fall. Human nature reflexively did God's will. So like. It wasn't correcting and turning towards God. It was mm -hmm. following towards God, if you want a direction. It was reflexive. I noticed Orthodox using this term synergy, which reminds me of the Greek Greek for works. Uh, works is erga. So a little, a little bit close. One of St. Paul's go-tos. Comment on Paul's disparaging view of efforts. Is he merely speaking legally? Um, I think this is a good question. And no, he's not speaking just of works of the law, because the fathers also speak of that, you know, uh, works of the law of nature. And so it's not doing works per se that save. Now, the confession of Dositheus, which is pan-Orthodox because the Council of Jerusalem 1672, um, says that works done apart from salvation are not, uh, apart from faith, are not efficacious for salvation. And so that's why we need faith and we need faith and works as St. James talks about. But that doesn't mean this is why people have to look at the, the harmony of the saints. It's like the harmony of the scriptures. That doesn't mean there are people that, you know, don't go to heaven because they, with that deathbed repentances, right? There's people like the thief on the cross that he had the, the right orientation. He repented before he died. He didn't do any work. He did a working, right? right? Like faith is a kind of working in a sense, right? We're orienting ourselves towards God. So I would just like to say work is just the accomplishment of the faith. And you can't have true faith without actual works unless you die right away, which we, you know, we have saints that um, repent and die. And, and so, and, and they're in heaven. So I think the reason the West gets caught up in this, because they look at his works as accomplishments or like, necessary merits so you could get enough on the scale to be saved and in orthodoxy what we're doing is by grace 
God is correcting what happened in the fall, that this oriented tropos, right? And so what's needed is repentance. It's to orient the tropos towards God because what we're going to be experiencing is God for eternity. That's, that's, that's what the afterlife is. So hence, I think what a lot of people argue about when it comes to faith and works, they're arguing about a Western, a Western problem. If you look at the issue uh, in the lens of the patristics, the emphasis is very different. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's a problem. It's never been a problem for the Orthodox. I don't know how. Uh, and I mean, everything we do would be considered works, right? Even prayer. I mean, is is that? Uh, I, I'm not really familiar with the whole debate within Protestant, to be, to be honest with you. But it always seems very, very. I mean, uh, the, the quote, Father Pisces Ipate, he's the rector of St. George's in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. I remember him telling me he's like. It's like I don't understand this whole obsession you guys have with faith and works. He's like, and he's like, we see them as the same thing, right? Like, yeah. even and if you read the scriptures, the term faith and faithfulness, it's the same Greek word that's used as the root, uh, pistis or something. I can't remember. Pistis. Yeah, it has yeah, trust and so it. It, it's the same Greek word. But if you look at all the usages of faithfulness, it's listing then a bunch of works. Like you can't have works divorced from faith unless you just die instantly. So it's like they're. They're, the Orthodox mindset doesn't see these things as loggerheads. It's the legalism of Western Christianity that's made this whole issue where it doesn't have to be. Right. Okay. Trying to decide what few questions we're going to take here. There's a bunch of them. Um, well, I see a lot of got, thank yous. We've got Fabio. Thank you, Fabio. How you doing, Fabio? Old friend of ours. What to advise to Orthodox in Roman Catholic countries who venerate uh, Immaculate Conception devotions, such as Aparecida? I don't know what that is. You, I don't you, know what it is either. It's probably in Brazil. <laughs> probably it's from Brazil. Um, well, they should stop, I suppose. I don't know if they should continue, but I mean, they're certainly probably going out of uh, some kind of devotion, right? They're going thinking that this is a good thing, but they need to learn why this doctrine is as we presented tonight, very problematic. So I would say they need to be educated and catechized, continue their devotion to the mother of God, but not in a way that's not pleasing to God. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for the question, Fabio. Question, did I hear correctly? A sinless infant not baptized is not saved. So there we go. We're going to open up a big can of worms here. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to close it back up. Read the saints, read the, read the Pan-Orthodox Council uh Jerusalem 1672 and that's so what again, we go by. again yeah it, it, what is salvation what does it mean to be saved I think these are I, I will add this though because like apparently I got too hot water because I didn't nuance my answer enough with Dr. Gavin Ortlund on a on a, a similar matter we're speaking about what's normative there's exceptions to these things uh you know like Trajan's in heaven because Saint Gregory the Great prayed him out, out of Hades right so like, so the point is what we're talking about, this is what's normative, right? We, we, we don't speak of exceptions. Um, and so we, we leave that to God. Interestingly speaking, out of all saints, St. Augustine actually gives a criteria about how uh, unbaptized infants could be saved. And so like, and which is not common actually among the saints that they're just, I mean, and let me add this thing, like uh, Dimitrius Staniloi, which I'm sorry I'm pronouncing wrong because I don't know how to speak Romanian. Staniloi. Stanley, like he's right. emphatic that baptism is necessary for the salvation of infants, and and if he when he's canonized in the upcoming months, he'll be like our first liberal academic saint because he's the only person who'll be a saint that I ever see liberal academics actually cite approvingly. But he's emphatic on this issue. So like, what do all the saints understands that no one else does? Hmm. You know, I, I would just say we just have to don't heed me. Maybe I'm misrepresenting the well, saints. Isn't, Go it to the saints. Similar, isn't it similar to the whole question? Is there salvation outside the church? And the question is, salvation is the church. Christ is the church. I mean, these are questions that I think just now does that mean everybody's damned outside the church? Well, but that that question of what the soul will encounter and be is only God's. God alone is the judge of all that. We, we don't judge individuals. There's no yes. individual unbaptized infant, no individual Protestant or Buddhist or whomever, a Roman emperor that persecuted Christians. There's no individual that we judge. So it's it's both hands, you know, as, as I like to yeah, say. Yeah, and, and so hand. like the, the book of Revelation says all the liars, the 
the uh, the sorcerers of this and that will be in the lake of the fire forever and ever. You know, so that means anyone who told not the just, lie. Not just the sorcerers, even what? those who are cowards. The cowards uh, and... Even the first, yeah, the, those. So who right. Are, so that's mean yeah. if you if you ever told a lie, you're going to hell forever and ever. It, it's giving classes of people, and what we're saying when we say, so here's a class of people that's not saved. Here's a class of people that is saved. Orthodox Christians are saved, but that doesn't mean you as an Orthodox Christian are saved, right? Yeah. I can't judge that. We're just we're just speaking of classes of people. Yeah. Um. Give us your spiel here about your work online uh where I, they can I was actually kind of hoping to avoid this so it wouldn't be like i'm going on a channel well, to promote I, I myself. We, we weren't focusing on that at all but they're asking they want to know where to find you orthodox christian theology.com is that what it is yeah but orthodox christian theology.com is the blog there's actually an article about a lot of what we talked about today a few different things in it as well um there is a youtube channel the same name and um, I recommend for people who really want to get down and dirty in this to Google, let me get the title of the article, Original Sin in the Byzantine Dormition Narratives, as in Revista de Logica. Um, it comes right up on Google. You can read it uh, if you really want to see the latest scholarship on this issue. The main thing is there's not one person who is saved apart from the intercession of Theotokos. She intercedes in prayer for every single person. And so, to be honest, it, this was a difficult issue for me when I heard some of the things that were said because we want we want the, the mother of God to be honored and we want her to be venerated correctly, you know? And so that's why I really wanted to do this was for that reason. This is an issue very dear to my heart. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity. But yeah, if you want to hear my musings on this issue and other issues, you can find me the, there. Same question about other R.C. Marian devotions, such as Untir of Knots and Lady of the Glory and Roman Catholic apparitions. I just know I, that, uh, I'm sorry, you, you, you father. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, yeah. New Martyr Daniel Sezoyev um, does say that uh, there's obviously miracles outside the church. And so if God works outside the church, the saints could do things for people outside the church. Doesn't mean we're going to endorse everything they claim to be an apparition. You know, usually the opposite, right? We're going to be even more skeptical of it. But of course, we can't discount categorically God and the saints doing things outside the church. There's even um, venerated in the uh, Russian Sixnarium uh, Roman Uniate icons. Um, they were, you know, they were from the unions, but they worked miracles. So it does occur. So, and, so that's, a, that's a good thing to, to point out here, though, because that is not a criteria of salvation at all. The, the working of God, God working miracles for among the Orthodox, not among the Orthodox, among this and among that is not equal to. Therefore, there's grace of God there. There's salvation there. There's life in Christ there, which is what a lot of people immediately assume. Well, he must, because he showed a miracle here, therefore they must be favorable to him and have a relationship with him. And actually it's the opposite. Miracles are for those who don't believe and don't have eyes and don't aren't a part of the household of faith. It, we don't need miracles in the church because we live the miracle of the Eucharist and, and communion with God every day. And yeah. God's very big and we're very small. God's trying to draw all people to himself. Yes. And... I forget which saint, who's the saint that's locked up in the tower and an angel brings her the gospel. She she saw, she said she knew God was real by looking at the stars and stuff and then the angel brings her the gospel. So like, we have no idea how God is bringing people to himself and he could be working through miracles and these miraculous encounters. We don't judge these things. We God is good. He does these things because he's good. And what we affirm is what has been bequeathed to us by the apostles in the tradition of the fathers and in the scriptures. So Ben comes back once again and says, I don't think that's an argument against IC personally because it was proposed that removing Mary's sinful impulses nullifies her synergy. I mean, I don't remember anyone say this nullifies synergy. It, it, it would compromise what she did via synergy, which is praiseworthy. So if that makes it at all clearer, as St. John Maximovich said, you're taking away her greatest merit, right? if we take that away. So yes, someone 
someone. Um, yeah. So again, so like, the, you know, go ahead, go ahead. Adam and Eve, of course, synergized, but the point is they did not acquire the merits that the Theotokos did. So that's the point at issue. Mm -hmm. Sinlessness is not the same as salvation. Okay, so when you say immaculate, it's neither a sinless per se, affection, nor salvation. It's a kind of pre prepared spot. Again, it's, it's sinlessness is just not committing sin. Is this necessary? But salvation is a union with, with God, right? It's an actual dwelling of his grace. So they're two different things. Sinlessness, what did you say? Initially, I didn't hear that. Sinlessness is not? Yeah, sinlessness is not the same as salvation, right? Sinlessness is not having committed sin, not having done things to separate us. It's a negative, it's a, it's, a, it's a negative state. And that's, I mean, it describes something you're not. Okay, did we lose it? I think we lost, uh, looks like we lost Craig. We are at the end. Are you there, Craig? Let's see if we can get him back. Let's see if we have any other questions until Craig comes back. I think that's it. All right. Let's see if we have any further questions. Clarence Williams, yeah, there's some room to interpret baptism. Uh, good presentation. Yes, but the baptism of desire and the blood needs to be covered. Exceptions exist in regard to being baptized by water. Donated via ancient faith news. I don't know what that's all about. Uh, why is Chris the topics I consider for the future? Uh, oh, we just got you question. back. You were <laughs> why, why am I wearing hats? It has to do with my bad neck in this this chair. How could I wear a fedora on this? I also find like I don't wear ball caps as much anymore. Like, and so I find that, like you know, I'm getting a little older, and I don't know, my, my dress is changing with age, <laughs> but if you if you see me in public, I still wear the hat. All right. That's an important, important. Uh, Apparently important uh, to people. Uh, Trench has a question. When bad things happen, priests say it's free will. And God does not get involved, no matter how bad the church gets hurt. Yet, on small things, God and free will do not. That's kind of like an atheist objection. Right? He's saying that when it's bad, it's our fault. But when it's good, it's, it's God. But that's true, right? When it's bad, it's us rejecting the grace of God or someone else rejecting the grace of God. And when it's good, it's us cooperating with the grace of God. So your issue is just with how it all really works. Yep, that's, he, that's true. All right, I think we're done. I don't see any other questions. I'm sorry if I missed any of your questions. Um, I'm sure I did. So I appreciate, I, I apologize. We got the important question was, was about the hats. So we didn't yeah, miss There that. we go. <laughs> The point of things you're wearing a hat, Father. Yeah, I, that I always. <laughs> you won't see me without a hat usually. It's pretty rare. I said, well, at the uh, uncut mountain at the uncut mountain conference uh, during the liturgy when you have your hat off. Yeah, I'm um, like, true. oh, that's what Father Peter looks like without a hat. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a, only when I liturgize. Yeah. All right. Well, it's been a joy, and I hopefully it's been I hope it's been very helpful as well to many of our brothers and sisters out there, whether they be Orthodox or they be interested in Orthodoxy and they be. Uh, uh, under the, uh, uh, you know, in the realm of the Reason and Theology podcast, and they're wondering, well, I wonder what the Orthodox say in response to these claims. So hopefully they've got their answers tonight, and it's been beneficial. We really uh, hope that this will be the first of many such discussions. I think it's been very been beneficial, especially on a topic so important and something that you covered so thoroughly numerous times. I was looking around before we started tonight, and I saw something back Years ago, I don't know, was it three, four, five, six? I, I, didn't, I didn't pay attention, but you were you were on with Lofton and Eric Ibarra on the Reason and Theology podcast. Yeah. Were you a, were you initially a part of it? Was it kind of a pan, uh, pan Christian uh, dialogue initially? It what? was that. That's what the original. That was what the original idea was. Um, but the show got rebooted. It def definitely got rebooted. Yeah, it's now, <laughs> now a different, a different animal entirely. All right. Well, God bless and thank you for all everybody for joining us. And go and and uh, take a look at the written article that's been posted. Right? It's up yes. now. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Take a look at the at, at uh, Patrick's uh, article there, and um, I think you'll 
you'll be beneficial. You know, going back again, looking at it again, I think it'll go even deeper and you'll get some really corrections. We need to, so often to be corrected in our in our understanding of these fundamental spirit. It really touches on so much of the spiritual life. That's what I was really excited about when we were going through the patristic authors there. You, the implications for our own spiritual life are so profound in what what the, the life of the mother of god that's why it's so important to read saint maximus yes. the life of the virgin or yes the virgin that's been out uh for years now from the monastery in colorado which is this which is a collection of quite a lot of material or anything like that read it because it's the great example she's our great example not the great exception and so we when we need to sit and learn that's why it's such a tragedy when people reject the mother of god they reject the, uh, that she's the mother of God. I mean, how many Protestants, under, unfortunately, write under our, our videos, mother of God, what are you talking about? Well, of course. I mean, learn a little church history. The church has dealt with this in the in the, in the the 5th century, right? In the four, early 400s, they, they've, they've clarified this. The church fathers, uh, it's it's all there, and we don't have to reinvent the will. And it's it's the church very much consciously pre presents the mother of God for all of us uh, to follow, to imitate, and for and to and to have her intercede for us and beg for her intercessions, it's uh, it's so fundamental to the spiritual life. So these are very important topics, and I appreciate your joining us. Thank you, Father. All right, God bless everybody. We'll see you soon on another edition of Orthodox Ethos Podcast. <laughs>
Amen.